and, and you, you sort of wonder like at what point do you kind of go okay I'm just gonna I'm gonna take the risk and then that's it right yeah, well, that's really it is. I was talking to my brother about this yesterday. There's a point in time where the, the whole fam my family, the four of us, and we've all had our battles with this, that, and the other, where in the end we're just going to say, oh, you know, fuck it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and drink that. I'm going to go and smoke that. I'm going to inject this. I'm going to take that pill. I'm just going to go, I'm going to enjoy it. And if, if at the end of it, <laughs> it just says, well, you know, you simply cease to exist anymore, well, we'll be do. Would be do. I mean, we've all had three score and ten, so to speak. So I mean, yeah. point comes where you go. Enough is enough. Now I've got your voice coming through there. Okay, I'm going to test as well. Test, yeah, test yeah. That's well, okay. how, how, it's all good. Yeah. It's all good. I think it's a bit cleaner. Of an now audio. let's on on the basis of this. Tell me, what are you doing? It's great. It's fantastic. You're setting up a podcast and you're, you're going to stream it to the world. And well, sadly, I'm not streaming because I don't, I'm not I'm so much, no, I don't mean streaming to the world as in streaming. It's up there. I. Uh, this is number 11. This is episode number 11 already. Uh, and this Regu is, Regularly or? I try. It's, I didn't realize it was going to be such a, uh, a time requirement. It's about five hours of prep for every episode. Right. Okay. And um, not just prep, but then doing all the editing and stuff like that, I didn't realize that it was going to take so long. Um, but one of the ideas was to learn how logic works I want to get involved with more audio post production and it was, it was like and I maybe you can sympathize with this you have all these projects that you did before you have all these ideas you're like oh, I'm gonna get to it I'm gonna do it I'm gonna get to it right yeah I will eventually but then you never do because there's always something that you had to learn to, in order to get those projects finished yep. but every time you go back to that it reminds you of how much stuff you haven't done. So the idea with this was to make something new that I had to publish and that I could make good enough to publish now and not spend forever uh, editing. Like uh, we were talking uh, about my, my albums last year, right? And you walked me through it. Like, and that was sort of my, the first time I sat down and watched someone work through using an audio workstation like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Going, like, I didn't know what a side chain was back then. I st still now I'm like, oh, that's what a side chain is. It's just an auxiliary strip that you put some effects on that you have to remember to turn on, on your, your board. You have to remember to put the send up. You have to turn up the send so it goes to the, the auxiliary. And then you can apply a certain effect or a certain set of effects to whatever's being send or sent to yep. that auxiliary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brilliant! <laughs> you think about what you're doing now in terms of a podcast. As you know, like the number of times you would have listened to that I've listened to, uh, for example, the poetry reading, but with music. Mm -hmm. And every now and again, the music you would go, it's perceptibly louder. And you're aware of it, but then seamlessly, the music ducks beneath, but doesn't disappear, ducks beneath the utterances that come out from the reader, mm -hmm. from the narrator, seamlessly, just so smoothly that there's no, no imperceptible are the volume changes, and that's side chaining with, with, with compression. Right. So as soon as that voice starts, bang, the music ducks. And in fact, there's, there's, they even sell VST called, VSTs called duckers, which is and nothing more than that's what it does. So that's what a ducker is. Okay. That's what a ducker is. <laughs> Yeah, well, and what then, the fuck is a ducker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was looking through all of these effects. Yeah, mother ducker. Because when you were showing me this, you were talking about all these plugins and stuff like that. I'm going, okay, well, first of all, I don't want to spend like another thousand dollars on equipment that I don't, that I'm only going to use once. That, so sure. that, that was sure. the big thing. Sure. Uh, and then I was also talking to, uh, was it Neil? Uh, Neil, uh, Wave. He uses Waves as well. All that. Uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, Neil. Um, right. Swayze, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so. I was talking to him and he's like, yeah, just use these wave, wave plugins and stuff. Like that. I'm like, oh, more, more buying stuff. Can, can I not just use Logic? And I did, uh, there's another guy uh, who also agreed to be on my, my podcast, uh, right. maybe next week or the week after. Um, and I asked him, like, can, can you just, can you edit audio without using plugins? And he goes, uh, with Logic. And he's like, yes, Logic is a solid program. You Absolutely. can do it. Yeah, yeah. And not only that, um, but it was, uh, and I was reading online, 
and this is more of me just trying to avoid overcomplicating everything, especially with those two albums that we were listening to, the Jimmy one and the, the, the rock band one, uh, or the garage band, whatever. But it was, I wanted that raw, organic sound as close to how it was being recorded as possible. Totally. And yeah, I didn't yeah. want extra stuff on it just yet. But that being the case with the podcast, I mean, I'm playing around with the effects, even just minimizing room sound. Yep. Like, it's a different artistic way of dealing with the frequencies. And all the plugins that you want to, you want to be able to do that, to produce a podcast, um, are all there inside Logic. Everything is there. I tried a few of them, though. And I don't know, maybe it's my voice. Maybe it's worse than I think it is. I thought I had a nice voice, but I'm listening back to it, and I'm going... Just I think that's always that's always a, a natural kind of phenomenon that a person maybe doesn't like the sound of their own voice. I sound nasally. Yeah. And I'm listening to it going, this doesn't make, like, I'm not a nasally person. I, I don't think I am. But uh, I'm, the other thing was, like, mic technique. I listened back to the first one. I had the microphone right up to my mouth because I thought that's what you had to do. Right, right. But then I'm like, no, you got to push it back about a fist, maybe two fists. Sure. And you turn up the volume on the, the microphone. Um, and then from there, that also reduces like your swallowing and your, your mouth clips oh, and stuff like that, things, yeah. which is stuff that I've never dealt with before. And, and apparently if you add certain plugins like a compressor to it, that actually makes it worse. Uh, it, it does, but then then you get, then again, you've also got um, software that comes out from say Isotope, but Isotope not exclusively, there are other companies as well, that will do things like they'll have noise emissions and stuff like mm. that. Uh, breaths, for example, you can remove the breaths simply by going through looking at uh, and attenuating a threshold. So you can actually take out a lot of that incidental noise. Uh, a lot of times I'm looking at tutorials on YouTube podcasts effectively mm -hmm. where people have put up, and I live by those. I mean, I need those tutorials and I'm watching them every goddamn day and then <laughs> night. You know, like you go, go to sleep looking at one, you wake up, that's the first thing you do. And you get to be very critical of guys that are putting this stuff out. You get you get to hear the the underbelly of their voices, the swallows, the stammers, the the glottals, the the, the sputum inside. You know, you think, God, can't you remove that? And the fact of the matter is, you can, but you know, but you have to do it. But you have to do it, which is another problem. Is it's that you, you have to sit down and actually do it. Well, you know, like uh, this morning, uh, I was last night. I was working on. Um, a project, a song on, on um, in Logic. Ableton had crashed three or four times, resulting in my here's the crash dialogue. You know, come on now. Are we on? Are we on? Are we recording right now? Yeah, we, we got everything. Oh, so we're going. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, <laughs> if you don't mind, or no, no, that's fine. That's fantastic. Restart again. Yeah. So, so here's the here's the the crash dialogue that goes out, and you know I've got to copy that in and put it into a letter that's apparently a non-reply letter that goes out to them. But for the heck of it, I'm there right punching, not typing. I'm punching. And furthermore, it's the last time I'm going to have to use. What a pity that it's come to this. 16 years down the drain of using Ableton, and I can continue to use this software no longer because it's crashing all the time. God damn you guys! You know, blah 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 blah. Send the letter off. Ableton's crashed. Open up Logic, and it's time to work in Logic with, by virtue of the fact that uh, I, I was wanting to do this piece, but of course I could only do it in Logic. Mm because of Logic's fantastic drummer. The drummer plugin, the, the different drummers that you have in Logic, like there's, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I forget their names right now. But like Soka or the, the Kenny yeah, and... Kenny and there's probably Barbie and I don't yeah. know, if there's, there's probably, no, there's no Barbie, but there's, there's, a, there's a couple of girls in there. Those drummers are insane. And more recently I was reading about how to use those drummers in odd timing. So for example, seven, eight, six, yeah. six, eight, all this kind of stuff. And that was opening up for me. That was what I really wanted with Logic, is I needed to have this drummer. Now, there's actually a third-party bassist as well. So that, for example, you could have, um, uh, what's the word I want? Um, an AI drummer, which Logic is providing. There's also an AI bassist as well, which uh, 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 um, easy, uh, Easy drummer. Uh, uh, easy no. drummer, but Toon Tracks. Right. Toon Tracks now supply the basis as well. Now I'm getting very close to the point I've been holding up, because of course, because you know, for people listening to this podcast, because uh, now that I know that we're, we're recording, people are listening to this and you know, they, uh, we're in China right now. Is that okay to mention yeah. that? We're in China right now and um, there's a lot of people here that are kind of trapped here. 
um, they're not earning any money, so they're on tight budgets, and I'm one of those as well, where, I, where all the things that I want and all the things that I took for granted in the past, every week would go past, and I'd be buying another VST and buying this and buying that, because it didn't mean, it, did, it mattered for ship because they were sort of relatively cheap. Well, there's a, uh, an AI basis from Toon Tracks mm -hmm. that I, I simply cannot wait to actually explore. I've just got to wait because I can't, until I know what my final fly date is and what my budget is, the day I know is the day that I invest in the package. Because what it'll allow me to do is to intuitively write pieces of music with 100% total feel. Mm. Now you can do that, you can, obviously I can do that with, with, the, with the keyboard, but I'm not a keyboardist, a pianist as such. Yes, I can play keyboards and do all that kind of stuff, and I can play a bass guitar on a keyboard, but it's never the same. You can get a wonderful sounding patch to do all that, but it's never the same. It doesn't have the same nuance, and what this software does is it offers you the nuance of a bass player, and Logic's drummer gives you the nuance of a, of a drummer, and you can do it by a wonderful little technique that I, that I worked on. It's so simple. It's, it's like all you have to do is to check a little box where you tell the drummer to follow the track. Yes. Which track? The bass track or the keyboard track or yep. whatever you want. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it, it literally, uh, when I first saw that happen, uh, I, the first thought I had was when, when I used to play in the Ukrainian polka band in Tampa, and they, they used to tease me that Oh, we, we can replace the drummer. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess that's true. It, you could have, because especially with a polka beat, uh, it's not very difficult. So yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, but now I'm looking at it going, it's not, the, ju not just the drummer you can replace. You can replace everyone. You can replace oh, everyone. Oh, you don't need to work with anyone. Uh, it, you, you come up with an idea, and you punch it in. You don't even have to, I mean, you don't even have to do it well. You, you punch in a couple keys, you use MIDI, and then all of a sudden it sounds like the instrument you want, and then you match that with your, your bass player, and then you have the drummer play along with that bass player, and now you've got your melody, your bass, and your drums all going. But extend for three minutes, and there's your, your well, that's a foundation track. Uh, and there's some support <laughs> software for that as well. I just can't think of the name of the software right now. It might come to me while we're talking, where you can build up the whole ensemble the whole thing, the whole nine yards, it's all done, effectively reaffirming what you were saying. Recently I bought um, software called Scalar, and this is absolutely stunning. There was Scalar 1, Scalar 2 has just come out. Scalar 2 is absolutely the, the, the bee's knees of, of composing. So as a composer, as you're sitting back there now, I still like to, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I covered a song called uh, Gangster Paradise from Coolio. I heard that. Yeah, well, it's not, it's not, I pulled it down off my site because it wasn't quite right. Uh, right. It's, it was all too raw, um, looking for the right voice and blah, 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 not just in the vocals, but also the guitar sounds and all that kind of stuff. And it was a rushed mix, but it was an amazing process to have to go through to get things done the right way by virtue of... Um, Breaking out the drums and using drum stems, blah blah blah. So, oh, yeah, so that was all. It was all you, but you used different instruments, like the different digital instruments. To different create. digital, yeah, yeah, sure. It was uh, totally the only thing that I, I actually composed. I remember I was talking about Scalar. I'll come back to that in just a sec. But I actually composed the intro because uh, there's only four chords in the song. But I composed this really delicate guitar piece, which I did sitting on bed with a you know, on the bed with a guitar in the morning, which is to me the best way to compose. Composing is still a traditional art form. I, I love. I personally love doing. It. I think a lot of people do as well. Particularly, you know, if they're pianists or brass players or whatever, you know, guitarists and whatever. But with Scalar, it's like you can set up some paradigms for the AI to come on in. You know what you're looking for. You know you're searching for something like, for example, you're doing something where you want certain emotions to be conveyed through the music because you're writing it because it's matching a lyric that you've written or because maybe you're trying to put together a soundtrack, which is what I'm working on a little bit at the moment, maybe mm -hmm. talk about later, um, where you need to convey certain kinds of emotions. Well, Scalar allows you to go through there to get to enter into that sort of room whereby you can target uh, chordal arrangements to match up 
what you're looking for in terms of the emotion and then go beyond that in terms of the rhythm. So it has a, a definition like I want it to be sad. I want it to be happy. You can you can go you, it can be as, it can be without meaning to because that's exactly what it was. You want a song to be happy, you want a song to be sad. You want to write a three minute Jack. twenty seven second pop song that's gonna convey uh, puppy love. <laughs> Puppy love, bang! There it is. This is this is the chord chord progression for you as well. And each chord that they are now throwing up for you has a variation. So in the end, it's like I could be sitting there, and I'm going to be working on a song where I've got my palette of let's say I've got twelve chords you know, for the diatonic scale. I've got these twelve chords. Each one of those chords has multiple variations. Mm -hmm. This is before I even enter into things like with rhythm and. Uh, uh, a tempo and all those kinds of things. Uh, so I can actually go through, isolate the chords that I want. Ultimately, I can put them together and, and just simply, I'll press that button there, which gives me this particular chord. Now I want to move from that particular chord. I want the emotion to be despair, but come out of despair into realization that it's all going to be good again. Right. And I can convey that through pressing that chord, that chord, that chord, that chord, just simply by pressing a button. Or I can also press the key on the on the keyboard as well, on the MIDI keyboard. Jeez. Once it's all done, or once I've mapped out what it is that I want, I can then simply uh, record that inside the Scalar software and then drag and drop inside my, my door. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Logic, Ableton, Cubase, whatever, whatever. So does that use keyframes then? Like it's automation, basically, that you, you're... You're, you're saying the key, though. Oh, the, the key. Chord, the, 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 but then like you just punch it in like there's a little triangle dot on the sound file, right? And you punch it another one. Because uh, I'm coming to this like as a film editor or like, even using no, logic, the automation. Right, okay. Less so like that. Less so like that that you are... Um, ultimately, this thing is called keyframes if we think about it from the filming side of things. Right. Yeah, it's kind of like that because you, you're putting in a... Um, a key point that's somewhere, yeah, yeah. but actually what you're doing is you might have a, a, a sequence of um, four bars, for example. In the end, you might just go with a four bar sequence that could be made up of one chord per bar or it could be made up of two or three chords per bar. That four bar sequence, which you've already, in the back end, you've gone through and you've mapped out these chords to be the most seamless, if that's what you're looking for, the most seamless transition in terms of a cadence. And when it's all there, you just simply drag it out and as an icon, it just simply drags across. Then the then the MIDI chords, the lines for each MIDI note, will appear as you place it in over the the instrument that you're working with. You know, it could be a piano, it could be a brass arrangement, it could be strings, it could be anything. So, do you still work with other people then? Because I know you have a drummer in Australia, I think. Yeah, well, the drummer in Australia, uh, and a little shout out for him because he's in Australia's big uh, hip hop band. They've been playing for four decades now. And he plays in that band, or he produced or he plays in that band. And he uh, does both, he'll talk woods. That's, <laughs> which is like one of the CDs I bought when I was in Australia. Well, there you do, yeah. there you go. It's, it's, you know, and, well, you know, you think about it, to, to stay for four decades in the industry, now he's been with them since 2010, I believe. Right. So, coming into the second decade. That means for a bunch of, you know, young kids to start a band in 1992 or something like that, and in hip hop, yeah, not like rock and roll, not like the dinosaurs, you know, you know, like the Rolling Stones and Aerosmith and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is hip hop, where people thought it was here today, gone tomorrow, when in fact it's here today and stayed it's forever. It's still there. It's still there. But the hill, the hilltop hoods, they've changed sounds over time. Yeah, they've what evolved. They, yeah, they, they, they've evolved. Like a lot of hip hop artists, and that's something that I that I re I both enjoy and. Re I, because I was doing gangster rap, and if you've already heard it, you know that uh, you already have a sense that. And I was on the, I was talking to Lee, the drummer. Uh, so that's the guy uh, from Hilltop Woods. He's, he's Lee, and he and I back and forth. He has a studio in Melbourne, and I would sometimes do my drums would be assembled down in in Melbourne. We would either do it by my virtually being in his studio, so I'd have to be there, or now we do a lot of stuff. We do it on remote control, or mm -hmm. not remote control, but. Um, um, What's the word I want? Um, remote recording. Right. So we're using, we could use any kind of software for that, but we're using Cubase because it's actually all in, in, it's entwined inside Cubase. There's a software package that comes within it, blah, blah, blah. And you don't have to use Zoom or anything like that. But with a lot of the other software, I think you've still got to use, I know with Logic, with Ableton, 
with um, uh, da, da, bum, uh, Studio Live, you still have to use, to use other third parties, but with Cubase, it stays totally within that thing. Is there you are, you're printing. You got someone in another room in another country, or another city, or whatever, and you're printing their performance onto your door on your computer. Oh, so it's showing up like real time. It's showing up in real time. Okay. It's coming up in real time. But the beauty of this is the file that's coming up in real time is the low grade file. If the take is what you want, you simply go click, hit a button, and the real files download from the external computer in the other city, country, wherever. So how long does that take? Because I imagine that depends on your internet connection, which here in China can be kind of dicey. Yeah, well, we're behind the great uh, wall of China, as we all know. Um, no perceptible uh, hindrance. No. So if I was after a three-minute drum track, mm -hmm. and that's what we're working on, uh, it would take the setup time, to make sure that everything is working. And then the drum track, which is gonna take three minutes, would take three minutes, and then we do the downloads. The downloads could take um, anywhere from, if you're thinking about it in terms of multiple microphones, and so it's drums, it could be five or six oh, right, tracks yeah. at one time. That could take 30 minutes, 40 minutes for so one song. How big are the files, like from one microphone? Well, one microphone coming into one track at around about three minutes, which probably come out around about 40 megabytes. 40 megabytes, okay, yeah. 40 megabytes. So I, you I still that stuff kind of small, because I think about video, if I have to upload anything to YouTube, I, I, I dread it. I mean, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you, some, you could be uploading, if you're, if you're doing good quality, you're going to be uploading gigabytes. Gigs, and you're sitting yeah. there going, okay, did I, did I remember to click upload before I left the so host? With, with that, <laughs> exactly. With that kind of stuff, what I, what I tend to work on is my... Uh, my uh, my routines for temper tantrum. It's my temper tra ta tantrum pantomimes. And the sounds that I can come with, you've got the, the you know, <laughs> <laughs> you have your breakdown. <laughs> if you haven't got those sounds happening, <laughs> I'm sorry, but if people don't work in studios, they're listening to this, they've never been in a studio, they've never worked with a computer, you know, where you're facing a computer with a door or with a, with a, with a film editing suite, the, the the unmistakable sounds of a breakdown. My neighbours upstairs, you know, they get. <laughs> I feel for these guys. They've heard everything over this last uh, this period of um, COVID because they hear my rehearsals uh, when I'm rehearsing uh, my live show, and they hear the breakdowns. And some obviously they're hearing me singing and going, you know. And some of those vocal takes that I'm doing are absolutely atrocious because you know I'm working on a part. I'm trying to get the part together. And they're thinking, I hope he doesn't do this professionally. Oh, that's. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, cat scratching on a green board, blackboard. Oh, <laughs> actually, actually, they, to, just to, to, there's a beautiful little corollary to that story because the guy upstairs, who's a bit older than me, uh, speaks pretty damn fine English, very fine English, and uh, probably better than me to, to some extent. And we caught up the other day recently downstairs as he was throwing his rubbish out, and uh, I was sat down, coming back from doing whatever I was doing. We stopped and we talked and blah blah blah. And once again, as I do every time I sort of see him, I always apologize and say, look, if the noise is ever too great, just simply come on down, knock on a door, and I'll stop, you know, because uh, you know, I don't want to cause any problems there and all that kind of stuff. And he keeps on telling me, no, 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 we love it. My wife and I, we love your sort of four o'clock show or five o'clock shows if I'm <laughs> streaming a show live, it's usually about five o'clock. We, in we the hear, morning or? No, in the oh, okay. morning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> really understanding it, four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> really, really feeling it, boy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, uh, he, um, we, we, we talked at length and he said, you know, like, where can I hear your music? We know you do it, but where can I hear it? And I said, well, look, okay, I've got a few different sites and I'll, I'll we connected on WeChat, which is what people use in China. and. Um, uh, we I exchanged a few of the, the websites and anyway he went and he listened to the music he was getting right off on it so and I was in the middle like, later that night I'm doing some stuff in the studio ne in the room that, next to where you and I are talking right now and there's some messages coming in from me he said oh man man I love this these songs you've done by a band called uh, Led Zeppelin you know so this guy's like in his <laughs> 60s and he's yeah. never heard of this band before and i've done a few of their covers oh, and he's just wow. like he's going right off on it so it's fantastic i've actually invited just before i leave and i do a do a one final rehearsal or whatever i'm going to do in terms of however i do my rehearsing 
I just thought I'd invite them down, just go upstairs, knock on the door, say, listen, come on, you guys, you've listened to me for two and a half years all the mm-hmm. time, you know, you're very welcome, come on down, and I'll play a few songs, so, um, which would be a nice gesture. He's a really nice guy. As I say, yeah. so. um, I'm not sure what the point that started all this out was, but we, we wound up here, but doing a, well, recording. And, uh, oh, yeah, remote recording. Yeah. And, and, uh, and you asked me, uh, so going back to that question, you asked me, do, do I still work, work with people? Work with actual people, people not just like fake people. Uh, yeah, well, you know, this hasn't been a, you know, being in China for a long time, I, and also I was very much connected to the band that I, would, that I used to play with back in Australia, and I found it very difficult to, re- to get with a bunch of guys who were of a mindset that allowed me to fit comfortably in the style of music that was being played, either Either I felt this, this, this thing, and it happens with music, either I felt that my own ability was a little bit too high, so that was making it very frustrating for me to have to deal with people who couldn't match where I was. Mm. Or in some cases, but not that often, and perhaps really only one time where I was playing with a couple of guys, two Russian dudes, uh, a drummer and a guitarist, and they were in China for, a, I don't know what they were doing over here, I think their wives were working as teachers or whatever, and they were the musicians just hanging on, sort of tagging along. And um, goes back to about 2012, 2013. These guys were really, really good. And <laughs> gets intimidating. Yeah, well, it, it was to a degree. Before I realised I was actually holding my own by virtue of it was me that was putting all the ideas forward and, and, and making the direction. But they were better musicians than me. But I realised why that wouldn't last with the language issues. And that's the second factor. It's really? the. It's been very difficult to work with 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 people over here because of language issues is if these guys who say Chinese for example or if they come from other countries that don't speak English mm-hmm. and the other thing is that as I said to start out with the, 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 the sort of approach to music and the style of music that people would want to play that I would want to play I've always found that very difficult to sort of be with guys because I got spoiled playing with the guys that I was playing with in the band back in Australia a long time ago and I've struggled since those days to actually want to be and play with other people. I, I, I sympathize because uh, especially finding like these drummers, uh, the, this automated drumming and this automated, uh, the thing I've been playing around with was the, the iPad and GarageBand mm-hmm. and the, the autoplay function. Because my big thing is like I have these drone videos that I refuse to pay for royalty free music. I'm like, I can make this shit. I know I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You press play and it does scales for you and it does this little solos and it can be simple, it can be complex. I'm sitting there going, why would I work with, I mean, it's going to sound bad, why would I work with other people if I don't have to? And it's not that, and it, I guess where you do need to work with people is where you run up to a wall of you don't know how to make this sound just that much better. It's the same as like, uh, nowadays, I've started using Canva for image manipulation. Mm-hmm. I've and heard it looks, of it, but not familiar with it. Right. Like, and you can make a, a decent looking graphic, right? And I can look at it and go, yeah, it looks good. But then you get someone who does it as a living and you go, oh, no, that's good. Right. So the same with a musician. You can sit there on an iPad and go, yeah, that's listenable. I can, I can do that. But then you have someone who like lives this. And that's where you hear that difference of professionalism of that melody. Totally. And, yeah. and, and the musicality where you're sitting going, oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> that's where I've had to um, publicly, because I keep on putting stuff online, and I make these releases, and as we're talking today, it's the 23rd of June, I think on the 20, it's, I think today's Tuesday, is that right? It's Tuesday, yeah. Okay, so 23. Before it's uh, Wednesday, I think on the twenty sixth of June, I've got another uh, another album coming out, which is a. You fourth think you don't know this? Well, it's not it's like a massive international release. <laughs> it's, a, it's it's a massive international <laughs> release. It, it is coming out. Um, it's just going to be whether it'll be the twenty sixth or whether it'll be the following Monday or whatever. Um, and so again, I'm doing this kind of like airing of a of a of a. Of a of my inner consciousness, my psyche, my emotion, the whole thing that I'm putting out for the, the so-called world to, uh, to listen to. And whenever I do that, I'm putting myself on the line by virtue of, you know, oh, that's what that guy's ability is. Now, people would assess that as being, wow, he's really good, or he's not very good. 
and he's somewhere in between. Yeah. And I got to I got to suck that up. I have to suck that up. And uh, this gets back to this idea that I've had to sort of publicly air my own in this period of time in China my own musical. Uh, development because I gave music away when the band sort of split up and by the time I got to China all I was was just working as Joe Blow uh, a language teacher and make no bones about that right. a lot of people come to China work as language teachers I you think and I, that's all we are how we all came here. I think that's probably why because we're all on the road searching for something and in my case I know that I was searching for something to run away from music and I know there was a busted relationship blah 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 so there's all the you know the, the necessary background to to expel me out of the country I came from to push me somewhere else, and give and give music away to a degree. But I was never you know I was never you know kid star you know the, the number one musician in the yeah. country I came from. I was just another 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 guy struggling so to speak. But then as time went by, as you kind of know anyway, the backstory. I just decided to, to become more and more and more involved in what I was doing and. Um, this gets back to your point about doing it all by yourself and then actually confronting somebody who's really doing it as a profession and you can see that you can see the disparate levels you can see the disparity and that's not a bad thing though I'm not saying that uh, that you're saying oh he's so much better it's that you can work together where you're like I need a drummer who can lay down something more than what I can lay down using the iPad automatic drumming feature right and I, and I understand that because uh, I my the thought that's always gone through my head uh, as being a drummer um, is that I'd like to think that I can make a tuna can sing mm -hmm. that to be that good that's always been my my goal as a drummer to be that musical that you I all I can have is a, a tuna can full or empty and that I can make that m make music from there and from that point like uh, expanding that and that's why one of the uh, the reasons I wanted to get into Logic is so I could start seeing how the other side of music production was. Because I could do the percussion, but then there was the melody. Like, if I couldn't hit it, it was very difficult for me to create a melody. Like, sitting down and learning guitar, it's not going to happen. I can't coordinate my fingers. I'm not going to, I don't want to pick up a guitar. I know it's a piano. Okay, it's a percussion instrument. Sure, in way. Sure. Mm. But in terms of uh, developing that musical ability is to have that ear that you're going that you think and are able to go okay that sound can be made into uh, given the right context can be made musical and so uh, one of the things I've been working on uh, a lot is just natural organic uh, like clapping snapping uh, using what's around me as creating music uh, the latest one was when I heard they were aerating our vents I don't know why but I heard it and it was like going dunk 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 dunk. I'm like, oh man, this is EDM right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta, totally. Sorry, I'm, I gotta zone out for a minute here. This is fantastic. And I recorded a bit of it. I uh, I popped it up or put put it into uh, Logic Pro. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can see how you could mess around with this and how the uh, the the base sound or the basic sound that you're given can then be modified and all the frequencies can be changed into even more so, so there's the initial musicality that you're given with that 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 recording and then in post-production you can take it and either butcher it or make it sound oh, totally even better um, for people again who are listening to this and who maybe don't have that experience with the, with the DAW obviously we're talking about we're talking about software like uh, Logic Pro X, and we're talking about Ableton, we're talking about Cubase, and we're talking about uh, Audition. Um, yeah, uh, Studio One Professional, we're talking about uh, Pro Tools. Pro Tools, we're talking about <laughs> Bit, Bitwig, we're talking about, which is apparently a big player, and they've just had a new release come out just recently. But the, without going away from your point, which is it's kind of very interesting, um, because I'm only recently into Logic, and Logic, I, I came into Logic at Pro X. Now they've just put out the 10.5 upgrade. I don't yeah. know if you've got that yet, but it's absolutely insane. So, the point of view, the, the, my point for referencing that is that what you're talking about is so incredibly intense. You can take whatever you want. You can take a drum beat, just a straight up one bar drum beat. You can sample that and then mix it around all over the place. Now in Ableton, this was very easy to do, but it was less so easy to do in Logic until they brought in the new sampler. Oh, really? Is that what happened? Yeah, uh, Logic's uh, sampler was, what was it called, EX24 or oh, something? Oh yeah, they, they had that before. Yeah, that's they what, 10.5, they just put that in, because that's the iPad version. 
totally uh, garage band that they finally merged with logic oh robots. man i mean the interface between ipad and logic and what it allows you to do and you're just sitting there i mean you know i've got a i use uh, something that's in addition to the studio since you were last here is um, a Mackie uh, MCU MIDI controller it's, it's oh, absolutely yeah. sensational but in having said that there's a piece of hardware that sits in front of the, the computer monitor and it costs a lot of money whereas if you've, got, <laughs> if you've got a freaking iPad you can just do all the same thing plus you can have full control over logic on your iPad it's absolutely unbelievable that means you can just simply stand up and have it, it takes people away from having to sit down for one thing it's great because it takes you away from the desk yeah unless you've got a, a multi um, you know can raise your desk and lower your desk or whatever it's, it's which is a good idea but it's a great it's, idea it's, but I mean that costs money too you know <laughs> what I mean and, and also for a lot of us in working in studios and stuff here in China we're not you know we never know from one day to the next how long we're actually going to be in this city this country Sadly, well, I know every three months, I think uh, that that's sort of what do you think I pay about rent. That's I right. Pay rent, mail, okay, I'm good for another three months unless visa problems. <laughs> well, talk about that. I was good for uh, 28 days. Right. From January to February, February to March, March to no March. They gave 60 days. Right. Then it was then it was like. April to May, I think it was, it was like, am I going to get the visa? Am I going to get 30 days? Or am I going to be told to go? And then when I went back at the end of May, they said, listen, Buster, you know, you got no hope of leaving, so we're just going to be free. <laughs> So they've extended it for two months now. So, Great. Oh, wow. You know, like, uh, yeah. but so, you know, the idea of building an, a permanent studio is always a difficult decision to make. It's very costly as well. As you know, I had to ship a whole studio. And now there's a second studio because I've built up the stuff since the, right. the previous one was gone. Because to, to live here without any sort of recording equipment in this period of COVID was just it was an impossibility. So <laughs> not possible. Just not possible. I mean, I would have uh, without the, having the upgraded studio or the new studio come on in, um, purchasing a Mac and a few other little things along the way, little little mini um, mini keyboard and some other things. Without having had access to that, I probably would have gone insane in this, this period of time. Uh, yeah, I, I can see it. I mean, yeah, and one of the good things about this last six, seven months is that I've had the ability to sit down and finally learn Logic Pro, um, mm. which is basically what you said to do last year. You're going to have to sit down for six months and just learn it. Just do it. I think that's... Uh, I but think then, that's, then you said something else that really bothered me. Just Google it. Just YouTube it. I'm like, fucking Christ, God. VPN issues prevent me from just YouTubing anything. <laughs> makes it, it makes it difficult for anyone who's not uh, living in China. Um, and I don't think they appreciate that. And it's not just China. I mean, there's other countries that have internet restrictions there are as well. Yeah, yeah. And even in Canada, I mean, it is beautiful to think here in China, you're going, oh, blame it on the Great Wall, the Great Firewall. Then you go back to Canada and you try to access the internet. You're going, what? why can't I access the internet? Why is it so slow? And then it turns out there's some sort of issue ne network wide in your city that just happens to be the problem that day. I'm actually moving into a zone where I'm moving to in, in a place called Tasmania, just in the east coast of Tasmania. That there's in all the the countryside that's there, or the, uh, the bush, so referred to down there. Uh, there's a a little cluster of blue dots. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> I'm, apparently, I'm living in the cluster of blue dots, but it's not 100% clear as to what I'm going to get on the internet. My dream, of course, is to go there and have uh, totally free internet, not have to use a VPN with, with great speed. It may be a long way away from what I'm imagining to the reality on the ground. Now, the, that's the point. I mean, we've been able to use this time here, if the first part of what I said was, was kind of true, and it is, you cannot go forward on, on a door or on a uh, film editor or on any piece of software. Uh, Physical piece, right? Yeah, you, you, you can't move forward on it unless you stop and <coughs> devote an amount of time to it. Now, there's no, no surprises to, to realize that the globe in, from January to um, July effectively has intensified in its use of software. This is a revolution. We've gone through this revolution. <laughs> what about we're all the digitized now? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Because I mean, you, you look at the number of hits now that are going on the on uploads onto YouTube and stuff like that. Um, as for uh, self-help, uh, not self-help, but tutorials about how to 
uh, to connect with the world from sitting inside your room. And one of those things, of course, is live streaming. There's just so much information there about live streaming with different elements of software on your computer where you can integrate all those into the one live stream where people are now projecting their, their images digitally. Are you, are you live streaming now? Like, uh, no, I was doing it on Facebook very early on, but I've been live streaming since 2010. So I sort of figured, I sort of, I got to the point where how I'm tired of copycats, you know what I mean? <laughs> Not quite, not quite. I'm not trying to play, the, you know, look, I've been oh, ho ho me this whole world catching up to me kind of thing. Not really like that. I was, um, there's another reason why I sort of stopped streaming as much, was simply overexposure. I mean, who wants to go onto Facebook, if you, if you, with respect to my friends, and, and then they get this, oh, there's Steve streaming again, you know, come on. He was streaming yesterday, come on, he was yeah. streaming. I did it early on in this COVID thing because it was great because it was helping me I was missing playing live and I you know you know that I play was playing live in Beijing quite a lot and um, all over China all over China you, you lived a life of insanity I, I don't know how you did this uh, that you because our job required our job used to require us to travel quite a bit and you were always all of a sudden posting pictures of some bar that you were in you yeah, know, no, how did you find the time to get there I don't understand ah uh, well it was <laughs> It was uh, it was intense, look, I knew that, but but it was incredibly fulfilling, and I didn't realize how fulfilling it was until, of course, it all stopped and it stopped, stopped. It did. So initially, I, the, the pickup on that was through going to live stream on Facebook and that kind of stuff. But I wasn't happy with with the idea that um, I wasn't able to fully utilize the studio, so I was never getting the real sound that I wanted. Having said that, I was getting a very immediate sound put up by a little little thing here, a little stand here, put a, put a phone onto it, yep. and I used, uh, I was using a, a USB microphone, uh, uh, what's it called, a Yeti uh, okay. USB mic, for fine microphones, and I was picking up just the room sound, but I just wasn't getting, uh, at least I thought I wasn't getting the sound that I really wanted to get. Then I started to move into things like OBS Studio along with... I've um, heard of that one. Yeah, yeah. it's a damn fine studio. Now, uh, Going back into 2012, 13, 14, 15, I was using XSplit on the PC format. It's the same kind of deal. I just I wasn't familiar with what was happening in the Mac world then because I wasn't using a Mac. But the OBS Studio, it works on both platforms. It's wicked. It's really insane stuff. And you can interlink that with Zoom. And then with Zoom, you can have, and with Skype and all that kind of stuff, meaning you can have damn good visuals. You can have multiple cutaway screens, so you can be doing things in terms of tutorials and stuff like that, or in terms of uh, online education, really good kind of uh, software to have. Yeah. So I started to do some um, live streams with that, but realistically it was, it was more, it was just more problems, logistical problems, and I spent, we, we mentioned before a guy called Lee, the drummer down in Melbourne, he and I back and forth for a solid month on different cameras, different software, different protocols to have and whatever. It was intense and it was great and we got we both got success for what we're looking at. But then do I want to do that every time Single I'm gonna do a yeah. live stream? No, no, it's just, it's just So what did you settle on for your uh, your setup? Yeah. Well for the live stream setup, uh, it was kinda of cool actually. I was using Ableton. I used, decided to use Ableton because it was kind of easy to use. I used a uh, uh, what's it called? Um, um, bum, 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 bum. Oh, damn, I've forgotten it. It's a, it's a sound option that allows you to, it's an integrated sound option that, that allows you to talk from your software, drag the sound from your software into the OBS studio. Is it called, um, it's got, um, I've just forgotten the name of the software. Uh, it's a sound option, so I use that as well, along with OBS and along with Ableton to put oh, okay. the sound out. And then I was using uh, either my, phone with an N NDI protocol to use the phone actually as a as a as a camera right but then I also had a couple of Logitech um, USB cams and they actually had better quality so oh, okay. I just opted for those in the end so I could run it with two cams or one cam which cameras were you using are they 4k or they uh, no no 1080s. no they're 1080s right 1080s no that I have this problem that one of the reasons I haven't started video streaming this thing just yet is because I want to shoot it in 4k this is only 1080p this uh, Cell E I bought this when I first came to China right right uh, but my GoPro died uh, last yeah I heard you say, say that just recently so 
Oh, apparently I was using the wrong SD card for two years. Oh, wow. Which, and I burned it. I basically, I burned the thing out. And I was on uh, tech support with this, this girl. Uh, and she's like, well, can you do this? And I'm like, okay, yeah, nope, can't do that. Can you do that? Nope. And I'm searching online. You gotta, you gotta press these buttons and you gotta hold them for this sequence and you gotta do this. You gotta, I bought a new battery, I got a new charger, I, got, I replaced the SD card. And then and she's like, well, this is the final thing we can try if you do this. And I was like, hold this, this button and these things for this amount of time and it should reset the camera. If it doesn't turn on, then I'm sorry, sir, your camera is so was here or back in Canada? I was on tech support. It was chatting oh, because okay. I can't call people behind this great firewall. It's the, the Skype quality is shit. It's just yeah, garbage. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't bother calling people. If I do online chat, then at least it has a chance there to There is stay. some, uh, so you were going, you were trying Skype to Skype, so to speak. Uh, this was just online chat. Right, okay. Going online chat is great, but one of the things that has helped me immeasurably over the years has been Skype's, um, now I think One World is the airline um, flying alliance, and yeah. the airline alliance. Is it um, something very similar with Skype, whereby you actually get a phone number, and with that phone number, you can call multiple countries free of charge. But is that through Skype? Through Skype, yeah. Canada wasn't part of that. I know, I, I heard about this like 10 years ago. You know, come to think of it, I don't think it was, yeah. Australia is one of the few ones, same with the United States. The United, States. There's, there's the United States is good because they cover landline and cell phone. Yeah. Australia doesn't cover cell phones, which is a real hassle. And uh, yeah, I, didn't, you could, I couldn't sign up for it back in Canada. I was just like, are you kidding me? What is wrong with this country? They, they didn't sign on. Well, yeah. the reason why is because there's only like three carriers in Canada. There's Bell, there's Rogers, and there's TELUS. And there used to be MTS, which was in my home province, but Bell took them out, so they bought them out. So it was only like three, and they basically created a blockade of like anybody else coming in, which blocked Microsoft from uh, using Skype as a phone number. Oh, the wrong yes. because that, <laughs> that's, uh, cause that, makes, that makes communication when, when things go south. Like I know we, we talked before about Waves plugins, and Waves have got really damn good support. Um, you can actually get through to the tech department anytime, you know, so long as it's within the working hours and using phone calls direct with those guys where they would go in post that like within the phone call they would simply move on to the um what's that software that controls your computer again um like remote software remote yeah remote control? software yeah. uh there's um desktop remote or something yeah desktop remote something along those lines they'd simply come on in so you'd be on the phone they'd be controlling your computer and they'd be getting and solving the problems like that yeah and that would make you feel because it, it's, it's very easy to feel disconnected when you're a long way away. Uh, very easy. And you can feel sometimes that you're up against it. How am I going to solve it? Because you're not just solving one problem. In the studio, it's you're solving multiple problems. problems. It's, it's always, always problems. more than one problem. You know, to anybody, to anybody who is, because I can sort of speak to some extent as a grand older statesman of doing this kind of stuff. To anybody, you're still only what, 35? Yeah, yeah, 37, I said the other day. <laughs> that's my max age, and that's I'm topping it. I'm stopping at 37. I'm topping at 37 as well. But uh, for anybody who wants to get into this idea of, so you want to make your own films, make your own music, or produce your own media, y you have to seriously think about, I've got no, I'll have no time for work. Because there's just no time for work. Because ultimately it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an all encompassing package. Once you enter into it, it's a day to day situation. And no matter how much stuff is committed to memory in terms of software and how you can save this and save that, each day is different. You wake up and every day is a new problem. Yesterday it worked smoothly, but today it's not working smoothly. What is it? Because there's a third party problem that's come on in and you don't know how to solve that problem. And somewhere along the way in the next 24 hours, you're going to have to reach out to somebody because either through a tutorial or to, you know, like a chat line or something like that. Or just hopefully somebody you can find who knows how to do it because that's what that's what's going on. My uh, my approach has been especially when I hear or see people start these things, uh, and I remember this being a problem, fifteen years ago when I was back in, in Winnipeg, that I'd meet these musicians who were getting into uh, a lot of digital music production, but they'd get so enraptured in the technology, and I find this with sound engineers. Hmm. Sound engineers, I think, are some of the worst people to be in a band with. Because then they sit there and go, no, we can't do that. You've got to make it sound perfect. And you're going, no, just, just press record and then publish it. And like, it's more of the, 
just get it done so we have a record and then we can listen back to it, see what we did wrong and then know it for it next time. Yeah, yeah, so totally. when I see people yeah. start to I'm like, make it simple for yourself. Make it really easy. Press record, make sure it records and then publish it. And then from there, you can start working on, okay, well, I heard this, the, the room noise. How do I deal with room noise? Okay, so then you look up, just solve the problem of room noise for your next recording. That's the idea of, and in fact, it's funny you should say that because I was in that same conversation last night with the guy that does all my artwork. Uh, anyone, and there'll be a support link because I know that Steve's going to put something sure, up on yeah. And uh, there's a lot of artwork there that I've been working with this guy for years now who does all the design stuff for me. And what's his name? His name is uh, Levin Staines. Out of, he's out of Brisbane. Okay. And um, we were discussing last night this because we've got a new T-shirt release coming up, something I'm really happy about. I'll talk about it in a bit. Did he design the, the Two Bitsville? Uh, he did Two Bitsville. Okay, right. He, going back into 2014, that was the first album on the so-called comeback trail. Uh, he designed that sleep. So he's been with me ever since that time. That was his first with me. Mm -hmm. And he was the singer going back many, many, many years oh, ago wow. in the band that I was in. We lost contact for over 20 years as we, you know, we went to different parts of the world, blah, blah, blah. But last night we're in this conversation which was exactly what you were saying about. You're in, you're in a band situation and you're with sound engineers and all you want to do is just get something out and they're going, you can't do it because of this, you can't do it because of that. Because so all I'm saying is, listen, we just got to get these t-shirt designs done. We've already, I've already got the designs done through uh, my brother who's a designer and another couple of people as well, including uh, Levin as well, who's going to be designing some uh, shirts too. And I was just simply saying, let's get the designs up there into a portal. Uh, let's, for example, say Shopify or Equid through my own personal website, blah, 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 linking to that, and then to other portals as well. Let's get them out there, and then we'll deal with the printing side and the quality that comes from it. We'll deal with that later. But let's just get the product out there. This is not a time to sort of say, because how many problems, how many projects, sorry, get stopped when people confront that wall oh. of difficulty and they'll go, well, I can't do it because it's too difficult right now. Yeah. And so they back away from it. And that's where I was about to say a moment back, and this gets back to something I was talking about before as well, where you publicly expose your imperfections because it's through the imperfections that you improve, which is what the point you were saying as well. Yeah. That is, you know. But even still, when you press publish, it's still good enough. Like you're, you're still proud of it and going, but that's good. Like I, and one thing that I have with music uh, or any media production is that when I publish, I go, would I watch this? Would I would I spend time on this? I go, yeah, I would. Even yeah. though I find that even once I press publish, it's uh, especially with the blog. Blogging writing is like one of those things. When do I press publish? It's when I can't stand the thought of going through it again. I'm like, no. No way, I can't do it. I am not reading this whole thing again. <laughs> Just press publish. Yeah, but then I yeah, come yeah. back to it later on and I read it go, oh, yeah, that's, that's actually pretty good. Same with music. I think I'm a nine for 10 there. I think, you know, like nine out of 10 times I think I'm getting it right. And then every now and again, I'll get one that's just like, nah, nah, I should have done that. probably should have done that. My, my <laughs> idea is that, again, I said imperfections, you, you allow people, that's how you can judge the merit of somebody because you can actually go, well, look, there's some work that they've done. It's, it's not that good, but then wait a minute. They also did that, that piece there as well. And I've definitely got moments like that. I think of, of all the stuff that I put on, online, uh, there was one act, there's one song on Two Bitsville, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's a song called Dust. And the, the song itself is a really great concept related to the drought uh, in Australia, the, the drought and the way that affects farmers and, and countries all over the world have these sorts of problems. If it's not a drought, it's something else. And um, the song was something that was kind of special to me because it was written, partially written by a guy who I don't have much contact with anymore. Lyrically, it was then taken over by a guy that I've had more contact with in these days and have had for many years now. And then there's also my part as having written the music for it and I thought the music was really kind of cool. Actually, it connects in a strange kind of way to uh, um, um, Gangster Paradise because it's four chords rolling back to back to back. But a massive production. I had lots of things happening here, there, everywhere. I had different narrators coming in for, for, a, for an intro component to the song and all this kind of stuff. But in the end, the mix that I came up with in my own vocal performance didn't come up to scratch. And I was, uh, it goes back now about a year and a half back and uh, some guys in Australia play a lot of my work on their radio station. 
and um, I happen to be listening in unannounced, not just listening into the radio station one night. They play some great roots music, and I really love to listen. Which to Which is good to do. You have that sort of omniscient look. You're like, okay, I'm just going to look, listen as everybody else is listening. Yeah, totally, totally. But to my frustration oh. <laughs> and ultimately despair, they played one of my songs, and it was like they played that song of all the songs. <laughs> they played the song, the one song. They obviously liked the song. And that's the thing, like, where you publish it, you're going, ah, it's, it's horrible, and then someone, but they're like, I like the feeling behind it, or the emotion, and that catches a lot of people. Totally, I mean, totally, with the, yeah. especially with music, you, you sit there going, yeah, no, as a uh, music production engineer, you can sit there going, nah, I don't like how I use that, that I should have panned it just a little bit more to the left. I could have, you know, uh, bumped up the EQ or something, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, right, right, sharpened right. this, tightened that up. And then, but people are listening to me, no, I mean, you could have done all of that and it still wouldn't have changed the idea of the song. And the way that I heard, as a listener, the way that I heard it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then, from, from what you just said then as well, you became, you become almost just like those sound guys that you were talking <laughs> about before. You become so critical of the whole thing, in which case you're defeating the purpose. Yeah. It's just, because how can you predict what another person is going to actually hear? Some of the... Uh, over the years, some of the um, takes that I've done or, or, or dummy records that I've done that people have actually heard and I've recoiled on, they've actually gone, wow, man, <laughs> really, I can see where you're getting it. I mean, radio stations would play my stuff going back into the uh, 1980s. <laughs> and I would be like, Oh, you're kidding me? Are you gonna you're gonna play that? I mean, I've got this stuff over here. Yeah. No, we're gonna new material, and you're you're playing that stuff. Yeah, but I remember it's my brother taught me this one uh, a long time ago in terms of um, something you said before about a producer of, of this, that, and the other, and how you want this and you want that. Mm -hmm. And he told me this story that there's a, a very famous, or relatively famous producer going back in the '70s, and he's it was an American dude called Lou Reisner. Lou Reisner was behind some things, uh, Rod Stewart, Elton John, uh, The Who, the musical Tommy that came out in the 1970s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lou Reisner was a part of that thing and my brother was connected to Lou by virtue of the industry. He was a designer, he was doing a lot of record covers and all that kind of stuff and he was connected to that. And Lou, as a producer, would always say to my brother, you got to listen to this piece of music, but you got to listen to it loud. you got to listen to it loud. Everything was loud. Because if it was loud, you'd defeat all the, the noise. Oh. <laughs> Just pump it out and blow it out. Right. And over the years, I've actually learned to um, temper my own emotions. Like, yeah, sure, I want everybody to listen to the music the exact same way I listen to it. Headphones on, banging you to the, you know, to the, to the max. So you can hear everything blown up, but of course people don't listen to music like that. People listen to music when they're doing the ironing. Well, and they're having a lot softer, I think. I mean, because this has always confused me. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm different uh, in that when I'm listening to music through my headphones, I usually have it cranked up horribly loud, actually, un unsafely loud, mm -hmm. for like EDM or metal. Mm. Uh, when there's a double kick drum, I like I, this is has, it has to be a lot louder. But other people, they listen to these very these gentle songs, and you're still they can still have a conversation with you with their headphones in. I can't. I have to take my headphones out and go. Oh, sorry, what? Yeah, yeah. Because like if I have my headphones in, there's no way other sounds coming in because I don't want other sound coming in. Right, oh, because you're focused. You're yeah, presumably focused on what it is you're listening. You're listening for something. You know. But apparently, some people listen to it actually at a, a safe level, and they don't try to like listen to the music through their bones it, it's just through their eardrums and they yeah. don't want their eardrums to ring afterwards it's bizarre it is and then you have and you have to weigh that up as to how people are going to listen to the music i mean i'm not by any i don't see myself as a i like a hard ass and hard edge guitar as much as anybody um but in the end people are going to listen to the music the way that they want to listen to it so in the end something that I've worked harder towards in the last, say, particularly in the last two years, and more so in terms of this last six months, because I've been concentrating heavily on production, how to produce and get that, that, that definitive sound inside my music. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting closer, I, I sort of feel, is that people are gonna to listen to the music as a package where no matter what it is that you're, you're saying musically, 
if you can, can get if you can get that package controlled that people can listen to it at multiple multiple levels of volume like a variable levels of volume and take in an emotion from that either a low volume or a maxed out volume if they can get that feeling then I know I'm beginning to do my job as a as a producer of music so what level do you mix at like for for me the standard when I'm sitting at uh, with headphones on I, I use these KRK 858s I think like they're, they're like they're flat headphones mm -hmm. like they're meant for mixing and I have my laptop set at bar number four and then logic is all at zero right mm -hmm. so zero dB but the the MacBook uh, volume level is at four and if I can four out of ten four out of whatever like the volume is one two three four right okay right. So, so it's it's, it's 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 that level out of not out of ten. it's not the full ten it's four out of ten I guess okay and okay. then with that I go if I can listen to it comfortably and for a long period of time that's the level that I mix at I don't I don't increase the volume I, I don't increase the laptop value uh, uh, volume I increase the volume in logic and if I can't do that then I have to look for other ways to increase the volume so whether it's a compressor or something else or mm -hmm. you know throwing it through, through a side chain and boosting the gain that way or something well like that. you know that's a I didn't pay much attention to how I was listening to the Incredible! Here I am monitoring these <laughs> these songs, and and um, I, I was I, I used very good monitors in the studio. I can't use those right now because I don't have them because they're on a, they're on the docks in Melbourne. Which ones did you use? I was using in the end uh, BM eight eight BM eights from M Audio, but I was also using um, a BM three also from M Audio, okay. which are desktop speakers, and I bought those ten. 12 years ago here in China and they're, 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 they're brilliant, I love mm -hmm. them. I learned to, to mix on those kind of like little desktop speakers so I wasn't listening to it at a very large volume. I was using some AKG headphones which were studio headphones and then some Behringer headphones that I bought in a city in, in Harbin in 2003 and they're the ones that I'm using even today because they're the only ones I've got here right now. So I certainly know how they, I know how they sound they're not great headphones by any stretch of the imagination, but they handle the job of mixing and mastering as well or, or in terms of like using a door uh, with a computer. And, but what I wasn't paying attention to in the past was how loud I was listening to the music. And I was listening to it very loud for oh, wow. a lengthy periods of time. And there were days where I would have ringing in my ears and I would walk away Got a little story about this one. Uh, walk away with you know, just thinking, oh, this is just not right. You're doing something wrong here because you, know, you, you can't hear out of your right he right ear anymore. Yeah. And to this day, I will not use a phone. I hate a phone conversation at the best of times. I struggle to have phone conversations. It, it just hurts me. But I will not use my right ear to have a. So I only use my left ear for talking on the phone. But the hearing on right and left is equally the same. But I think probably on my right ear. I may be beginning to lose, as happens with age, you, you lose, you roll off a little bit in the higher frequency, so probably around about, I don't know, 10K or whatever, I might not be hearing the same in my right ear as I'm hearing in my left ear. Uh, I just want to cut away to that little anecdote. It was 2008, uh, I was working on a bunch of songs, I wasn't seriously back into music at the time, or at least I thought I wasn't seriously back into it, but I was spending a fair amount of time and I was proficient enough in 2008 to be actually working on a volume of songs that four or five years later did get compiled into an, into an album. Um, and 2008, it was around about August, I believe. And so here we are, we're getting ready in 2008 for the Olympic Games that are coming up, so this could have been July. Olympic Games are coming up in August, August the 8th, blah, blah, blah. And I'm working on this bunch of songs. And it was a, it was a pretty free time. I'd only recently been split up from my girlfriend within a, a couple of years. So I was living a pretty full-on kind of a life. You know, like there was a lot of, I was, I was drinking a lot of alcohol at the time. And I was listening to a lot of, a lot of music, very, very loud blowing my head out each night while I'm getting smashed in my, in my so-called <laughs> studio, which is just like a, a bedroom, blah, 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 blah. So one thing led to another, and I must have 
gone too far on this, this, this listening to the music too loud. And all of a sudden, the reality was, oh my God, I've done my right ear, I've blown my ear oh. drum. So I'm walking around, not for just a day, I'm walking around for days. Oh my God, I can't hear. I have to sort of, you know, blow into my nose, this kind of thing, I try to clear my ear, nothing would happen. There was a constant ringing in my ear. I'm, I'm feeling as if my whole world is caving in. And then there was this day, and I forget the actual date, but I'm on the edge of my bed. I'm, I'm depressed. I'm as depressed as a motherfucker can be. It's like I'm losing my hearing and to boot as I'm trying, covering my right ear, covering my, my left ear. I'm losing my balance as well. And then I remember this, I crossed over my left leg, over my right leg on the edge of my bed. I covered up my right ear, no, my left ear, so I'm, my bad ear was the one that I was actually hearing with. And all of a sudden, everything started to shake. It was like shaking, oh my God, I was like, oh no, shit, I've lost my hearing. Oh, I can't, this is ridiculous. I can't hear anymore. It turned out that what was happening some three or four thousand miles away to the southwest it was this massive earthquake. That was the Sichuan earthquake. The Sichuan earthquake. Yeah. Yun, Yun Chun or something? I can't remember what I it can't was. remember the actual name. But it was in Sichuan. And, oh, in, um, no, no, it was in um, Yunnan. Was it the Yunnan er earthquake? Okay. It was the Yunnan earthquake. And the shaking that I was feeling was actually the tenant, the building, the tall building that I was living in, because the whole Beijing was shaking over 3,000 kilometers away as well at that precise time. Yeah. It took me, it was two days later that I found that out. <laughs> the, the hearing loss was temporary. It was just because I'd blown myself out. I was listening too loud. I tend to control now what I do. If I really want to get a level, I really want to experience it at a loud volume, I'll blow it out there for a period of time, but for a short period of time. Then I'm going to bring it back to a level that's sort of far more moderate. I'm listening to, on a sound card that I'm using, I'm listening to about at around about 25%. Okay. But the same as you on, on the faders, Unity is uh, zero dB. I'm always using. I'm trying to work, and something I'm working at a lot these days is working with all my faders at Unity. But then I'm working on my gain, um, so I'm controlling my gain. Also, oh, you hear gain different. I'm using gain differentials for each particular okay. channel, whatever it is. So it could be drums, bass, or whatever, or the different microphones in a drum kit. Or if I'm breaking out the drums from Logic, I'll still have different, because um, you know some drums are going to be louder than other drums. And I'll be controlling the, uh, the volumes with their individual gains. Something that I've picked up from just using different, reading different tutorials, but also from, uh, from and listening to what guys were saying about how when you take away from Unity on the fader, you're also taking away different sonic qualities. Oh, that's so, what it is. so I tried to, I, it started to make a little sense to me. It's very difficult to sort of, to actually pinpoint the difference, but I just noticed that the mixes that I'm getting now compared to say six months ago, one year ago, two years ago, they're, they're stronger, they're stronger mixes. Because when you take down the master fader, not the master fader, but the fader on that track, you're bringing all the frequencies down. You're bringing all the frequencies Whereas the down. gain just targets a certain frequency. Well, you can actually target a certain frequency if you want to come in through with that gain. You can actually set that to a multiband, uh, you can actually set up a multiband compressor or, or right. a, a compressor, and you can actually target a particular uh, uh, frequency and bring that that particular gain down as well. That can be a positive as well. I mean, it's not it's not just a it's it's like a rule of thumb to try to keep all the all the faders at unity. Um, whereas in the past, what I would do, let's say I had all the faders coming in, they were all at multiple different levels to get to get a mix, and then they were all being summed to come over to the master fader. And on the other hand. People are saying on the master fader, keep the master fader minus 6 dB so you're allowing headroom for uh, a mastering engineer to come in with your mix and then to you know add this, add that, add that, which all adds extra extra uh, volume. Okay, mm -hmm. So you need a, a ceiling of 6 dB to be able to handle that. Uh, the rule of thumb now is that because we're working on, now I don't, and I don't, don't fully understand this, but because we're working on, th on floating bit 32, um, um, 32 floating bit, 64 floating bit as well. Right now, um, distortion and clipping 
is no longer the same as it was when we were working in the analog world. It doesn't technically happen, yeah. And it doesn't. I, re I remember I, s I sent you that clip, uh, that Jimby clip that I had where it was maxed out, and but I'm listening to it and there's no distortion. And That's right, yeah, yeah, you. I'm like yeah. going, but it, it looks distorted, like because it's, it's flatlining on yeah, both yeah, sides. Yeah, I'm going, yeah. okay, it's a flat, it's a brick of sound in, in logic. But I'm not hearing anything, and it does. It has something to do with that three-two bit floating point, whatever it is. But you go to one. That's exactly but yeah. with that, apparently that's only if it's listened to within a digital realm. If you take it out to an analog source, you might hear clipping. Uh, but with that, there's even some give. It's like it's it's clipping. It's it's distorted, but not distorted. Definitely, when I bought the the mixes that I was doing back into my analog, uh, my Allen and Heath. Uh, Z16 desk that I love, although it's a, it's a Firewire desk, so it's a sound card as well as a 16 channel desk as well. Again, that's from the docks in Australia. Um, I could pr be producing something on the computer that was exactly what you're saying. It's just a brick wall. And I used, for a lot of times, I was using a, a Radiohead as my reference tracks, different albums, different songs of theirs that I would have, and that would my, be my reference tracks track in my mastering uh, stage and what those tracks were were just a block it was just a brick hmm. you know you had to really expand that brick out to see that there was some dynamic activity taking place but if that was all just compressed into a, like a track that was just simply not um, you just looked at it from a, a yeah this from was a, fully zoomed out yeah this was fully zoomed out it was just like a yeah nice because I wasn't gonna get that word in the month of Sundays it would just be a brick, just a total brick. And you would say, well, how could that possibly not be clipping? Well, in the computer, it wasn't clipping. But as it came back into the desk, there were those unmistakable red lamp lamps sort of flickering. You know, you're, man, you are pushing this to the max. But could you hear it? Could you hear any clipping when, it, when you pushed it out? No. no, no. Yeah. No, the I... problem was that I got caught out with this because the problem was that I did a couple of masters based on the idea. Look, I mean, you know, like, I don't hear clipping here. <coughs> The red, the desk is telling me that this is clipping, but I don't hear any clipping. But so then people on the other end are playing it on their phones or whatever, and they're sort of like, uh, this is pretty distorted. You know? That, and I've noticed, uh, I get a headache when, when it's too loud like that. Uh, my ears, and when I have to take off the headphones, I go, ow, why is, what's happening? That's usually when I'm going, something's not right in the mix. And that could also be actually the, the effects that I'm using. I might be boosting the gain or some frequency where you're going, it might not, you can't audibly hear it, but your brain is picking up and your ears are picking up because they're sensitive to, to those sure, frequencies. Sure. But yeah, when I see the hit red, I, tr I try to get away from red anyway, just just to be safe, bring it down another couple of dB. But I, I use the master faders right now, not the master, but like on each channel, I just bring down the full volume. Uh, right, but well, maybe I'll start doing the gain instead. The gain thing set to unity, now this is, because that, of course I was caught up in this world of which way would I do it. I, I started to sort of talk about the idea that you've got this, uh, you have your master fader down 6 dB, it's going back into say a mixing and a mixing situation for me about one year ago. You have your master fader down to minus 6, six dB. Then you've got your other faders at varying levels. Now what I was doing to get around the problem when I was still seeing red or there was still some clipping somewhere along the way, the way around that was to select every track as a, as a select all, bring down one fader, they all come down relative to each other. Yeah. But in the end, by doing that, you're again, you're taking away certain sound quality from the idea that you're reducing all the sounds, but you're taking away different qualities from each sound as you reduce the sound. Yeah. The alternate approach was to keep all your faders at unity and even keep the master fader fader at unity as well. To use gain on individual tracks to make sure that each track is working between between minus 18 to minus 12 dB. Mm. And you're well below zero at that level. And as you look across, you might have 20, 30, 40 tracks, you might have two or three tracks, it doesn't really matter. The fact is you're looking at green, 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 green. But in the, the real proof in the pudding is in the headphones. The headphones are really comfortable. So, so wait a minute, you're saying that you're using the gain and all the tracks that you've selected, you're turning that down, down to in its 12 in to 18, minus yeah. 12. So whatever that track is, let's say that there's no problem with this track whatsoever. Uh, I've got my fader set to Unity. Um, 
it's running at around about minus three or four. It's comfortable. It's never never peaking. It's no clipping or anything like that. What I'm now doing is looking for the sweet spot. And everybody talks in the industry, of, in the recording industry, as the sweet spot is between minus eighteen to minus twelve. Is that why Logic automatically does that when I import a clip? Every time it does. Is that, that what it's doing? I, I get it. It turns it down to like minus eighteen. Like, oh, maybe that makes sense. And with this thing, they're saying, yeah, it's uh, with the the zoom. Uh, you gotta hit minus twelve on the, re uh, the recording. Yeah, minus twelve being the high point for people yeah. that are not sort of familiar. Minus eighteen, obviously, un underneath. And yeah. You, you rising up to zero. But yeah, logic brings it right down zero. I, well, yeah. Not zero, but I mean it drops it down. right down. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't sort of hadn't noticed that. It's one of the things I have noticed. Because you record right into logic. I'm taking clips and I'm dropping them. Ah, okay. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, totally. Totally. That's what that's why I would wouldn't have been aware of that. One of the things I have noticed is that logic has struck me. This is this is probably there's no I have no real evidence to prove this. It's just struck me as being more alive with its faders, hotter with its faders than um, particularly with Ableton. So for many years, for about four or five years, I pretty much worked exclusively on Ableton. From 2014 through to 2019, I was pretty much exclusively on Ableton. And then all of a sudden, I started to move over to Logic and back, back again to Cubase. And then now Studio One Pro, which I, which I love, by the way. Um, and Logic. Um, just seem to be really hotter on the faders. Like you put a track in, bang! This is already, you know, it's ye yellowing out, almost red, really? red lining out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, uh, so I've had to work a little harder there with its with its pre gain structure, uh, with its gain structure, to make sure that I'll go in. So if I am working on a on a, a, a normal project for me, it might have obviously kind of drums and bass, um, at least two, but possibly more, up to four guitars if I'm thinking about overdubs. And then the incidental instruments like strings and all that kind of stuff. I could run 20 tracks in a project, so I will go through and control all those, um, the gain structure on all of those tracks. And now I'm getting some really comfortable levels, and I'm getting better mixes going into the mastering stage. So the mixes I'm doing now, I think, um, I think I've done some pretty good mixes in the past where I've been relatively creative. But I just think I'm getting better quality, better sound quality mixes at the moment. I think that so, you know, if I'm hearing things the right way, by working at the minus 18 to minus 12 across the board. And as I said to uh, some people in an, in an Ableton um, uh, forum in uh, Facebook just the other day, some people were talking about this issue of clipping and blah, blah, blah. And I just sort of, I pointed out the idea of the minus 18 to minus 12. But the big issue is not so much, there's a bigger issue, and that is, what takes place between the plugins. As people are passing sound from one plugin, moving into another plugin, moving into another plugin, that's where you get a lot of clipping and a lot of hidden clipping, where yeah. all of a sudden it winds up as you're being distorted, but you can't see where the, the distortion's coming from. You've got to go back in and look at your plugins to find out where the, as you transfer from one plugin, like from an EQ to a compressor into a delay or, you know. Like yeah, th that's something that I didn't understand, because like with, um, Video production. I think we've talked about this before. Video production. <coughs> when you apply a f an effect, it doesn't matter which order the effect goes in. I mean, aside from like the the final color grade, like the final coloring, uh, tweaking of the hue of the saturate centers, like the the final print. But you could put um, one effect, like a distortion effect, on top of you know a, a radio transmission uh, effect on top of a old VCR effect and it all gets rendered in the same way. But when it, with audio production, if you put the compressor first or EQ first, it changes the, the, the dynamics of the sound, and then that the next plugin only gets whatever the first plugin spits out. Totally. So it, it gets rendered sequentially, whereas in video production, it's all at once. Yeah, uh, that's a big issue. The, the, the two processes you just talked about, EQ and compression. That is a debate in itself. As but you, and you're, but you're even in terms of like adding, so the one uh, plugin that I use, the expander, because I mm -hmm. found that the, uh, I was looking for a way to cut out the room noise, and one of the fixes is apparently using the high expander, high expansion mm -hmm. plugin. And so I just put that in there, the default value of high expansion, that seems to cut out a lot of the, 
the uh, room noise that goes on in some of the recordings. Right, right. Uh, so that, that one worked. Um, but the other ones, yeah, in terms of like putting EQ first, compression first, limiter first, uh, there is people that argue it, and I, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a t it's a tough one. Right? At the moment, two things that I kind of have taken on board, but, but I am in a process of discovery here that I, I want to get to a level where I feel I become almost uh, uh, incredibly knowledgeable on the issue, and I'm not there yet. Right now, uh, as I was saying to a, a pal yesterday, I will use whatever software I've been given and use the uh, tool for fixing what it is I'm looking for or shaping what it is that I'm looking towards, shaping towards something to, to get to. But I'm still mostly a, a preset led person because right. all this software comes with presets. Now my understanding, my rule of, the rule of thumb I've, that I've taken on board is, okay, get the order right, so know what you're gonna do. If it's EQ first with compression second or compression first EQ second, that's the individual uh, penchant. But then get the right setting that you're looking for. If you can't hear it, like initially, because there's a lot of things to take on board if you can't actually hear it, set to a, a preset and then just tweak that preset. Right. At least that way you're in the ballpark. Then if you've gone for a particular setting and then you've got your second um, uh, plug-in or VST on top of that, okay, try to get something that actually follows on from what it is that you've, you you know stay in the same ballpark so to speak and, and just work that way just to, to, to minimize the amount of reinvention of the wheel every successive stage and if you do that if you do that uh, economically enough you'll come up with a damn good non over processed sound but a sound that's really enhanced to, to allow you to go into the mix stage. So then what plugins are you using? You got compression, uh, compression, well, EQ, uh, reverb like, probably. Definitely, and for me it was almost like, like I said a little earlier, I said, you know, when we go back a few years, when, when a new VST came out onto the market, man, I would buy it, because it didn't represent a huge chunk of our income at the time. At the time. And besides which I wanted, I needed, I felt I needed it. I felt I needed it to, to enhance my own um, ex ex exploration in this, the whole sound and sound recording kind of thing. I wanted the latest toy on the block, I work hard, I could afford it, so I wanted to bring it into the studio to see that my studio was getting a sound that maybe no one else could get. Right. But over time, I've defaulted to um, definitely I'm going to be using compression and definitely I'm going to be using EQ because each, you know, you want to get the best shape, you want to get that sound shape the right way but if possible if I can get that sound coming straight off uh, either an amp emulator let's say for a guitar okay. if I can get that sound coming from the amp emulator I'm not going to do anything I'm just going to leave it there but I am going to add some probably some reverb I won't use the reverb and the delay from the amp emulator em emulator because I'm looking to match maybe tempo or whatever definitely I'm using um, if I'm not using and not happy with that sound, I'm going to use a compressor and I'm going to use an equalizer. Equalizer first for me, compressor second. Okay. But what I'm not going to use are uh, a lot of, of, of chains or channel strips where everything's you know, all put in. I'm not going to use that because it shapes the sound to a way that's maybe not where I want the sound to go. Particularly if those channel strips include a reverb and a delay, because I do not want to use the reverb and delay on on the channel itself. I want them to be a sound alone. Right. So I can actually choose how much I want of the of the pure sound that I've got to send over there, then to have it mixed back in. You could call that parallel processing. To have it mixed in with the sound that I've got, that raw sound. I don't want that defined in my one channel as I'm sending it up to the to the mix stage. You know, I want to be able to blend the reverb so that I can have maybe just one or two reverbs for a whole project and then mix all of the instrumentation through those one or two reverbs. And mm -hmm. lately what I've been doing is using um, some convolution reverbs from uh, the various software packages, Waves, uh, and also Ableton's uh, Max for Live, which is really, really sharp. And Logic, I'm just getting into the uh, reverbs and stuff as well at the moment. But convolution reverb, where I can take a real sound from a real environment. So, for example, I might want to use the reverb from a particular bank in San Francisco. I go to that, I go to that reverb 
convolu convolution of that reverb. I set set it the way that I want in terms of um, in terms of as a send. It's a hundred percent. I'm using the mix, the, the um, effect only, no mix, and then I just send my um, instruments into that. And that's maybe all I use. So I'm using definitely I'm using less effects now than I was using two years ago, five years ago for sure. Five years ago, my tracks were all loaded up. Uh, we we talk a lot about technology, but. Uh, and you said that you in 2014 was like the, the restart, uh, the resurgence of your musical career, or? Yeah, yeah, it was like I made a huge decision by, uh, at the end of 2013, I decided that I wanted to record an album in 2014. And unbeknownst to me, much the same as unbeknownst to all of us right now with COVID, we did not know coming out of 2019 that we were entering into a shitstorm in 2020. <laughs> in 2013, I did not know that I was walking back into a, a job whereby one month into uh, 2014, I was going to lose my job by virtue of some visa complications that many of us were, who were working here at the time were all I've caught up. I've heard about this. Yeah. And so I, I took uh, an, an initial three month cut back, half work only, and then five months of no work. So I decided to hang out. I knew that I would be able to get work later in 2014, but I would have to go through a period where I wouldn't work. So I just decided to throw myself into the album that I decided I was gonna record anyway. So then w when you decided to do that, did you have material already ready? Or is it that you sat down and went, okay, I'm gonna restart everything. Let's relearn the basics and just um, plow ahead. What I didn't know how to do was to actually really record. Yes, I knew how to record. I knew how to use, I was using Cubase and I was using Ableton comfortably at the time. And so I knew how to record, I knew how to record songs. Um, I'd already done a few good songs, I, I felt, going back into that 2008 period when my ears were... <laughs> you blew out your ears. You blew out Oops. my ears. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I was probably blowing out other part, parts of the brain, to be honest. Uh, no, in 2013, when I went over to um, to the studio in, in Melbourne with Lee, the drummer, I knew that I was he had a very successful studio in, in Melbourne. I knew that I would be getting him to lay the drums down to eight songs that I had that I'd been playing live during 2012 and 2013. Oh, so you were playing before that. It yeah. wasn't like you just resurgence. Ah, oh, now I'm. No, I was. That you quit music for a while or anything. No, I was definitely back into music, mm -hmm. uh, but not full on. It was definitely. I knew that I could. I was good enough to be playing live, so it seemed to me to be ridiculous for me not to be playing live, and yet here I was not playing live, hiding behind all kinds of you know, screens and this, that and the other and all kinds of excuses. So I had to sort of take myself out there and perform, begin to perform live again. That was actually in December, September of 2012. And through 2013, I just knew that I was getting better. Although I wasn't, you know, I wasn't so good that I wasn't feeling a shitload of nerves before every show. And I, the shows were not great because I um, didn't think I had my have my mojo really down pat but I was getting better and better yeah. when you're saying you're getting better and better you have how many albums listed on your website and you mentioned one uh, like we were talking about two bits bill before hmm. uh, it looks as if you've been releasing albums every year uh, and how far does this go back I mean when you're saying you're getting better and better I mean yeah well, how bad were you before and what did you need to improve on uh, you know, I think it was the, you get you get to the point that you're producing work that this gets back to something you were talking about before earlier with the idea that you know you do things as DIY, but then you come up with some problems and you then you realize that there are people out there that are doing it much better. Their work, the quality of their work is much better. I felt that the quality of my work was good. Right. I felt that uh, the singing, the vocal arrangements and the vocal production that I, you know, because I didn't really like the sound of my own voice and here I was, I was singing and I hated the sound of my own voice and all that kind of stuff. Man, I mean, that, 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 that's, not a, that's not a great way to start. So I sort of thought that I needed to get that under control. Well, by, by 2012, 2013, I was getting my vocals under control. I became a little more confident about what I could do. The albums that came 
2013, I think there was uh, Charlotte Lowe's uh, Give Me Eight, that was with a duo that I was working, a duet that I was working with, with, a, with a girl, a female singer, and I was composing and arranging music for that project, so I decided to record that project uh, with her. And that was a step into recording, but I felt that my recording skills were letting me down. I wasn't as good as I wanted to be. So, so you didn't know anything about recording before that? So you'd done it, you knew about it, you have recorded I knew it about before. it. I knew that I knew that the software I had could record. I knew how to record basic basic things. There's no mm -hmm. worries about that. But not the in-depth detail that you know now, but basically. Not now, not to the level that I know now. Even if I, even, I've never been one to be, as an individual, I've never been one to really uh, articulate the skills that I acquire. I don't seem to be possessed with that kind of, I've never wanted to be a teacher of the work that I do, right. for example, <laughs> because I don't have those skills. I'm a person that takes on board things, put, commits it to memory, and then begins to practice it until all of a sudden it becomes second nature to me. Right. The second nature of what it is that I do, if somebody asked to to explain what it is that I'm doing, I would find it very difficult to explain. It's just something that I do. It's a, it's a, it's a point of view of being possessed when you're at the desk. You know, you get, you get, yeah, I know how to. You can flow with things because the, you see things that you don't see in, in in every everyday life. So, was there a musical life before 2012? What what was that like? Yeah, fractured and and, and, and kind of uh, unfulfilled because the band that I was in back in in Melbourne and that was playing through the 80s, we, we split up at a point in time in my life that um, I was the so-called leader of the band, but I was the most untogether leader of a band that you could have. <laughs> I just was not a together individual because I was, I was not happy with my so-called career, whatever it was I was doing. I was working as a teacher and I was a music teacher, but I was not working even permanently. I was what they call a, a relief uh, supply. Like a sessional or something like that? Yeah, or? yeah, working in those. I just could never seem to get a regular job. Now, you know, what I was, uh, I was just, a, I was, I'm a regular Joe. I was looking, I was told to, to, you go to school, you get educated, you go, you get a job, then you support your family. I couldn't do any of that because I never had enough money coming on in. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the band is working, we're, we're rehearsing, we're rehearsing, but we were never getting enough shows and I didn't have the connections. I connections that I'd had in the early 80s uh, by virtue of managing bands, I'd lost those connections. You were managing bands in the 80s as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Very early on in life I started to manage bands and was doing it quite successfully. And uh, But managed because I was hiding behind my own fears and okay. my own musicality. Right. You know, like, a, am I good enough or am I not good enough? Oh, I don't think I'm good enough so I'll manage instead. When in fact I was more than good enough and just wouldn't allow, I was having an ego, ego issues, you can say, ego issues. So the band split up. By 1994, the drummer and I, who were still close, we produced uh, three, two albums. Uh, one was called uh, Four Times Shy, which is a tremendous volume of music that we were playing at the time. Then the next one was called uh, Dust Up, uh, no, the next one was called uh, In Vaudeville, and uh, it was a six-track album, it was beautiful, great work. But I decided to let it go at that point. The albums did not become successful, and I thought maybe they would have some success. In, in what way? Like, uh, in terms of volume sold? So, in those right. days it was cassettes and, and records, and, and radio release. You had to get radi radio yeah. release, and it just didn't happen. Is this all in Australia, or was yeah, it this is all, all in Australia. So then, how often do? Because Australia is a bit more well, the, that coast, uh, the east coast of Australia, is very tight, well, very close, just like the uh, eastern corridor in Canada, where yeah. you have like Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, and if you're a band, you can tour that very easily. Whereas like my hometown, Winnipeg, is in the middle. Of Middle of the prairie. So, <laughs> I mean, there's very no touring. limited opportunity. Yeah, yeah, I mean, to it does it doesn't make financial sense to be touring very far unless you're going to like the neighboring town, Portis of Prairie or Brandon, which are like an hour and a half away. Mm. But you wouldn't be getting into a van and doing like a 16 city tour across Canada. You'd have to go down to the states and do that, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. which require all sorts of visas. Were you able to do that back in those days, or is that what you were doing? Or? Yeah, that's what I was doing with the managing side of things, but with the with the playing side of things and the band that I was putting together, 
I think this gets back to um, something that I that I touched on a little earlier as well. Even within the band that I was playing in, the fact of the matter was that two of the guys in the band, the drummer and myself, intellectually, were tight. Musically, we were proficient in the fact that we knew that we had to rehearse parts and reproduce those parts. Right. The same or as close to the same every time out. The, the singer, who's the art designer now, uh, was pursuing a career and a lifestyle with his wife, child, and all that kind of stuff that didn't allow him to make the rehearsals. And the guitarist we were using at the time was, was, a, was, a, was a genius on the one hand and flawed to the point of frustration on the other that he could either could neither a remember pieces that he would have played in the previous rehearsal and b for me a real turn off was that a frustration not a turn off a real frustration was that the genius was offset by the fact that he didn't know musical theory <laughs> right and i found that very difficult to work with it was just i would be in almost tears at being taken to that level by by the majesty of his guitar playing but then reduced to tears because he could, it, could, it would never be played again or certain parts it was so easy he couldn't reproduce and with the band would break down in rehearsals for example as a consequence of that our live shows were which were there were some good live shows but they were too infrequent because the rehearsals didn't allow us to do them mm -hmm. and uh, they were never from his point of view they were very safe because it was the only way that he could play the songs for a live show, was to play them safe and never really let go. So our, this driving, you know, as a guitarist myself, and I played bass in that band because we could not get a bass player to do the job, so I actually moved over from guitar to oh, bass. So you were playing bass? And I wasn't good enough to hold down the solo guitar spot. I always felt that about myself as a player. I, I really got a good feel about what I am as a guitarist, but I didn't feel that I was the yeah, this is the solo guitarist, the man who's going to be the sellout, um, you know, like the, the, the sellout feature of the band with these ripping solos. That wasn't what I, I was doing in those days. Would I do it in these days? Yeah, I'd love to play solo guitar because it would mean that all the pressure would be off, right? You know, you get called on every, every, every song for, you know, 16 bars to do this ripping little solo. Fantastic. I'd love to do that. You know? But can you? With, with, this is one thing that's always got me about. Uh, Guitar souls, and there were like when Metallica released their Saint Anger album, there was a big kerfuffle that Kirk Hammett didn't have any solos. And, so, and as a drummer, I sit there going, How often and how much can you solo? How much do you have to say that hasn't been said already in terms of guitar notes? I don't know, correct me, where am I going wrong in this understanding? Um, yeah, that's, it's insane, isn't it? Because I would say that. Every guitarist, except for the truly great guitarists, and how you define truly great guitarists is, is something I'm not sure I know the answer to right now, but I think every guitarist is, possesses a couple of standard licks. Yeah. Standard fretboard positions that that guitarist knows how to get to and can move in and out of those different blocks or positions, position in guitar terms is oftentimes called position one, position two, and position three, and then that repeats up the fretboard. I think each guitarist can, can replicate within the particular genre of music they work within, for example, a, a jazz guitarist or a rock guitarist, and I probably would come from the school of rock slash maybe a little bit of blues or whatever. Um, that you get these certain licks and every solo comes along you're just rehashing the lick you're playing a variation it's a variation on a theme but within that you're trying to take in on the variation of the theme you're trying to take in the context of the music and the emotion of the music and you you would like to think and i dropped a solo last night on a piece of music in um 6-8 which was in the key of b minor and um was a song from the band, the band that I've just been talking about, which I decided last night, which I could do in logic, going all the way back to the very start of what we've been talking about, 
that I could break out the drums and get those drums to listen to the bass line. Oh, I'd been thinking about it over the last few days, and man, alive, like it just came alive, you know what I mean? So when it was like that, I just thought, well, I'm going to the next level. And it was as simple as drums, bass, the song was already talking, I already knew that, I just had to put some strings, get the right string sound, and once I had that done, I was home. All I had to do was to lay down the gu one guitar track. I think the piece goes for about three and a half minutes, four minutes. I just needed to just be loose for four minutes on guitar and hopefully do the right thing and get the right sound, get the right ambiance, get the right feel. Well, I kind of got that. But did I use any different note formations or whatever that I may have used for a for a, a, a sort of a powerhouse guitar solo that I did a couple of days back or a couple of weeks back? Nah, it was the same stuff. It was like. There's position one, da -da -da -da. there's position two, da -da -da. there's position three. Now make sure you move between those. Oh, don't forget to use your tone selector on your guitar to make sure you've got a different tone here, there, and that's it. It's not rocket science, is it? Well, yeah, but then you watch a, a guitarist play a solo and you're going, I don't know how they do this. I mean, the, moving the fingers that way, but I guess that's more of a, a practice and technicality. Developing the muscle memory because I, I get the same thing when, when I'm drumming. People are like, "How do you do that?" Yeah, well, sure, I sure. I've been and doing it for so long. That's right. It's muscle memory. There's uh, there's um, two things. Uh, one is people just listen to what I said about guitar. There's I'm not the world's greatest guitarist by a long shot, and I can play it and play it reasonably well. I think, and it's always going to be there on any of the solos that are on my albums and stuff like that. Muscle memory. Coming back to that point. Um, Mike Tyson is making this comeback right yeah, now. Everybody's yeah, talking that, yeah. about it, right? And uh, Mike Tyson's former trainer, a guy called Teddy Atlas, who I, I could listen to any you know seven days a week, twice on Sundays, to coin a Tyson Fury uh, cliche, loved listening to Teddy Atlas. And they, those two had a bit of a fallout, because I think Teddy put a gun to Mike's head and said, listen, if you mess with my daughter, one, sister one more time, I'm going to blow your brains out. That pretty much ended <laughs> Atlas's and Tyson's relationship. But as Teddy Atlas, who's gone on to become a boxing analyst and trainer and blah, blah, blah over the years, as you said, listen, Tyson can look so good doing what he does in the, at this stage in these clips because it's muscle memory. He's an athlete and a guitarist and a drummer and all of us as musicians, we're all just using muscle memory. Some guys have got a muscle memory development or a muscle development that from a guitar point of view can make them go super fast. Would I like to play like those guys? Sometimes, yeah, but you know, I'm pretty happy defaulting to whatever it is that my muscle memory is working at. And I know I can pick up guitar on, on any day of the week now, so long as I'm in practice, and pretty much crank out a, a solo. I love being able to do that, you know, and particularly um, in the job that you and I would do, for example, uh, in the hotels that we would stay in often, I'd just be cranking out that guitar. Because you, know, you, were, you were always were playing. I mean, it was all the time. All the time. All but the you time. do a lot of cover songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I actually have a, a question about that. How do you get your licensing for your cover songs? Um, or do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, because they, for um, YouTube, you can't publish a song unless you have the rights for it, or it blocks you from monetizing it. Uh, and I know there are companies out there that you pay them like 10 bucks or whatever, and they take care of the licensing for you. Uh, so I, I'm wondering, are you doing that sort of thing, or is it one of those things that you need to figure this out as you go forward? I think it needs to be uh, looked into by anybody that goes down that road. In my case, you know, I learned very young at that the theory of the ostrich, you know, just put your head in the sand. <laughs> And that's been a maxim of my whole life, you know, if when in doubt, just put your head in the sand and hope that <laughs> things just go past you. I should probably be more responsible about it, but I always make a point in all the covers that I do, um, I can't say this for live shows, because I have made money from live shows, of course, not much, you know, because of the, what the nature of, say, because I've been doing a lot of live shows in China, so I haven't made a lot of money from doing it, but I just, you know, I've been paid, I've been remunerated and all this kind of stuff. Um, I've never given over any of the money to do the, um, to the bands that, whose songs I covered. Ethically speaking, I get myself out of this situation by simply saying um, that you know I'm playing a song by a particular band, and you know always I would I would do this as often as I possibly could. You know, if you think my song's okay or my version's okay, please make sure you listen to their version because it's great. You know what I mean? Like that's one caveat that I've always tried to use. Even on recorded work uh, on albums as such, the early albums had no covers on them; they were right. all original songs. Okay, but the 
2016 I put out Toil. Toil was a mixture of originals and uh, covers. Um, I didn't really pay attention to, you know, for rights and all that kind of stuff, but I did make a point of, on all the material, it was always well documented that the album, the song was originally written by blah, 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 and I gave their um, name and, and publishing company. I think I did that yeah. as well. The only time it would become an issue is like if you sold a million copies or something. Then you have it. someone knocking on your door going, I yeah, need well, to talk. I probably um, want to address this because, you know, I've, I'm, it's ahead of me right now as I'm returning back to Australia and I know that that's going to be a different marketplace again than, uh, than China. I don't think uh, it'll be as easy for me back in uh, Australia as it has been in China to get exposure to an extent and to have the availability, the fun, you know, the availability of shows. Having said that, there'll be a lot of fairs and festivals in the island of Tasmania where I can be playing that will um, allow me to get a constancy of live work. And from that, I'm probably going to also probably get radio play along the way down in Australia. And I've already got radio play in Australia, so I've got to be very careful now looking into the next stage of life just if I am going to play covers. And I do like to play covers because one of the reasons I like to play covers is that I take from the original song and I'll turn it into my own song to the point of I'll be trying to be faithful. There are some things I'll remain faithful to. I might remain faithful to a, a motif or a riff or something like that, or I'll remain faithful to certain melodic kind of uh, arrangements. But once I've gone there, and this was always a key part of the band that I played in all those years ago called the Repro Masters, and we were called that because the Repro Master, the, the original drummer, a guy called Gary Devine, uh, was a graphic designer. And he would talk about, he would listen to our music, and he'd go, you know what, you guys are playing this because he came into the band as, like a, as a drummer called in to replace somebody else. He said, you know, you play these covers, but they're imperfect. You know, you're just like in, in the graphic design world, you're just like a repro master. You make copies, but everything, every copy is imperfect in some way. So yeah, that became our, our kind of a, that became a major thing for what we're doing. I've always stated that idea. I can learn more from covering uh, somebody else's song, musically speaking, than I can trying to create, in some cases, my own song, because the map of what it is that I'm trying to do is already laid out. And from that map, this gets back to that scalar software that I was talking about before. From that map, I can then extrapolate and go, okay, well, musically, I know they've gone from, let's say, from a D uh, minor in the key of C, they've gone from D minor to uh, key of C, they've gone from a D minor to an A minor, a pretty standard, you know, a fourth back. But I can get to the, from a D minor to the A minor by going back in through another chord and then shaping and reshaping the melody, come on back. And that's just musical, musical games. And I love doing that with covers. And so many people say that, that they, they learn their instrument by playing other people's music. Like, uh, sure. They listen to, like, name a popular rock band from you know, 20 years ago. They're like, yeah, that's how I learned it. See, I, but I was one of the people, I wanted to reinvent everything. I, I actually, when I played drums, started playing drums, I was like, I literally didn't listen to anything because I wanted to be the most creative, the most original. I didn't realize until foolishly later on that it, it that is such a fallacy because whatever you think you're going to create has probably been done already and that you do need to learn the, the, those musical dictionary elements yeah, basically sure, sure, sure. that people have already done and then you build upon that and jazz does that quite a bit um, rock music does it to an extent uh, but I think it's more in the uh, the guitarist world that rock would change but jazz that's where the drummers, we, they listen to something and they go, okay, that's what he's playing, that's the, the motif that we have to keep on, and this is the, the number of bars that we have to play for it, and then we, we can and vary within that. We have to think of the audience as well, because the audience to any one particular genre is going there for, for a reason. They're going there because but they want to... Does it matter about the audience? Oh, no, it or does it about the musicians? Yeah, the musicians, obviously, you would put the musicians first, the, the process of, with respect to an audience, the process of making the music is is something that you know you and I can speak because we're lucky enough to be able to play a musical instrument and I mean that in that respect it's 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 just it's good fortune that has allowed you to go through life and me to go through life knowing because I'd be lost without I don't know what I would do if I didn't 
play. Don't know what I'd be doing if I wasn't a drummer. What 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 would I do with my time? What do people do with their time? I don't understand. Uh, I can try cooking a little bit. Yeah, okay, I get off on that, but only to a degree. I could try reading a book. I can't read. You know, <laughs> you know but on that that idea of taking those covers and being cognizant of what people are doing and being aware of the you know the, the cliches and the, and the subsets of theory that make up the uh, the patterns that we've all got to work towards to, to allow us to communicate with other musicians because you that, can't do that you can't, you can't yeah. communicate but when there are people who hear of what I'm doing and they know that I'm working on this song or that song or whatever they'll get back to me and they'll say oh yeah but you should listen to their version of the same song but at that point that's when I get back to where you were standing and it's like look I'm sorry I don't want to go into that version of that song right now because I know the song that I'm covering right now and I want to cover it this is kind of like a really interesting twist I want to cover it in a unique and original way right. it's yeah. like I'm stealing but do you mind I want to steal it you my want to way make it your not own their way, way you know like, yeah. one of the issues that I've always had as a drummer uh, and this has happened, and it, it's part of being a drummer and part of the fact that maybe I wasn't as professional as I could have been or should have been, was that when people would say, well, you're playing it wrong. I'm like, well, because I was very much of the, the freedom style. Like, well, I took the idea and I made it mine. But then there, if you're going to be a working drummer, and this is true of any musician, if you're going to be a working drummer, you need to play it as it is written, as it is supposed to be, that the audience expects. Mm -hmm. And when we were in, uh, uh, playing in this, uh, this polka band, it is a wedding band. We played a lot of sure. covers. Mm -hmm. uh, we played a lot of traditional Ukrainian music. And the, the audience, we played weddings. And it was like, we, the drums had to be played a certain way. You couldn't be doing a 32 bar jazz fill. It just, I mean, unless they were like, okay, we're having, uh, okay, the lead singer fell off the stage. Cover it. Yeah, okay, okay, cover it. Yeah, go yeah. guitar for it. And then we go drum or drum solo. Okay, mm -hmm. everyone find the lead singer sort of thing, you know, and then. You know, it takes the distra distraction away, but uh, it, they had to be played a certain way. You couldn't change it all. Uh, and this was always my, maybe this is why I never became a professional studio drummer, was because I was incapable of doing that. I couldn't sit there and go, okay, well, I have to play four on the floor. I have to play the same rock beat the same way the s every single time. I, I don't, I, I understand how some people can do it, but for me, it was always like, I had to change something every time I was yeah. changing it. Which, I mean, even with the early band, that I, the rock band I was in, there were the elements that you had to play, you know, that way, the, the verse, chorus, you know, and then bridge. But the way that I played each one, as long as I kept the, the measures the same, it was okay. And we, we went off a lot of energy in that rock band. That's the difference between, um, in terms of an arrangement and being able to improvise during a piece. And I'm thinking about the way you described that. To have a drummer that can mix the beat around, but the arrangements of the song are the same. Let's say you're playing those songs, you know, like every week, for example, or every night or whatever. But if you move the song around from within, within the song, and the flavor of the drum is changing. So that's a, that's, from a musician's point of view, that's a great thing because you know as a bass player or as a guitarist, you're feeding off what the drummer is doing. Yeah. And so long as it, the band is tight to the point that, um, you know, that great phrase during the 90s was that su super groups became jam bands so they could just mix and I think um, uh, Dave Matthews' band was a fine example of that, but there were other bands. Were they a jam band, really? I, don't really I think of Rush or uh, yeah. Dream Theater. And I don't necessarily think Dave Matthews' band was that much of a jam band. <laughs> I've gone back and looked at some of the things, but that's what they were. They, you know, they, they, okay. were, they, were, they were sort of um, given that kind of um, kudos. But the difference in what you're describing now, because this is for people that are again listening, it was me that was talking before about the frustrations with a guitarist, because the guitarist wasn't able to improvise through changes from one rehearsal to the next rehearsal and the clear motives that you would you know from a from a band point of view you you needed those motives those riffs those licks to be there one night they were there the next night they were gone and that's the difference between the idea of a drummer that might not take on board, as you were saying before, you might not want to do those sorts of things, and that's maybe why you didn't become a session drummer, for example, where you're expected to do that stuff all the time. Um, as opposed to somebody that can still 
moves the song forward, but come up with variations on a theme, as opposed to somebody that couldn't come up with variations on a right. theme. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of jazz drummers can do that, where they are able to. They do both. I mean, most jazz drummers have to be studio musicians in some respect, in that they have to learn the phrasings. And part of being a jazz drummer, if you ever are, are at all considered to be a jazz drummer, it's because you know the classics, you know the standards. Yeah. yeah. Which is something that I didn't fully respect when I was growing up. You know, when I first picked up the sticks, I mean, I got sticks and the drums. I'm like, let's play, let's jam. Yeah, yeah. But there's a standard library, a standard set of songs. Your, your dictionary, your musical dictionary, you've got to learn that uh, in order for you to jump off and create whatever it is that comes for from me, that. From a guitar point of view, for me, uh, I would, I've always wanted to play in a blues band. I've never really have done, I've jammed a lot on blues and that's how I first learned to play music was with, with a, a buddy that uh, he needed somebody to hold it together so he could jam. <laughs> right. And you know, this is going a long way to waste before the internet, this is when you, you had to play with other people otherwise there was no way you could really play music. And um, so he decided that we'd start a university together and we, were, we enjoyed smoking dope together so that's what we were doing and all that kind of stuff which is what you did in those days. And he knew that I could hold rhythm. It's something he must have worked out relatively quickly. I wanted to play guitar, but I just didn't know what to do. So he would show me what to do in terms of playing 12-bar blues and all this kind of stuff. And just said, listen, you just do that. You hold that together for like four minutes and every, every 12 bars you're going to do this change. Kind of, it's going to be the same every 12 bars. Every, every four bars you're going to go from an A to a D, for example, or right. then up to the E. And he knew that I could hold that together, and I was, in, I was digging it. But what he was doing was just sort of jamming away at the top, and it was fantastic. Now, I've always wanted to do that and probably possess the skills to be able to do that. But to this day, and I tried to do this during the COVID thing as well, where I went online, of course, and I started to target blues leaks, and that's all it is. If you've got all these blues leaks down, yeah. you can do whatever you want to do. I learned a few of them. I thought, yeah, they're really cool. They were variations. They were actually tightening up on my own style of playing guitar. Because you know, whatever I did as a lead guitarist, it all kind of came from... Uh, knowledge of the fretboard, my own feel, and my own feel and my own take on what other guitarists were doing, but I couldn't do what they were doing, but I would do you know, my variation on that to get, to get uh, ultimately, I think, my style. But what it precluded my doing was to actually have those really, really, let's say 20 killer blues licks that any other blues bands would go, yeah, the guy can come and play with us, because he can drop those licks in just about on every song. I still didn't, I didn't have that. And I kind of still to this day don't really want to do that. You know, just, what do you mean you don't want to do that? I don't want to play those licks over and over again. Over and over again because they're the standard licks. Right. It's like what I want to do is to, yeah, I'm drawn to them and I'll listen to a blues guitarist on, you know, on whatever forum or whatever media that we're listening to be it live or be it on recorded version or whatever, and I'll go, wow, man, that's so cool. That's so cool, I love it. You know, it's gonna tear my heart out like it's gonna tear everybody else's heart out. Right. But for some reason or other, I think either A, the season has passed by virtue of the fact that I've developed my own style anyway, and that's where, I want, that's where I'm, you know, that's where I'm parked, or that's where I'm camped. Uh, or, I don't know, maybe C, maybe there is an intellectual problem, maybe I can't get there, you know, an intellectual or a skill problem, maybe I don't possess the skills to get there, time will tell on that. You know, so. Yeah, I found, uh, when I found jazz, I didn't start studying jazz and playing jazz until my early 20s, but, and even then I still had trouble locking in the pocket sort of thing, that, that drum beat, but I found actually it was almost liberating to be able to just play the jazz swing, and now one of my, my greatest one of the, f the f most fun I have sometimes is just sitting on the iPad and playing the ride cymbal beat, the da 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 da, oh, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. just doing that. And I've found that I can, uh, I mean, I haven't published these because it's just the ride cymbal, but just playing the cymbals or just the drums and just keeping the rhythm, keeping the, the beat throughout, and then, but ha he keeping that swing, because if you don't have the swing in jazz, then Forget about it. Then it, it's you, not know, jazz anymore. you know what you're talking about. This is something that I was actually I was searching for last night because uh, let me see. Well, um, no, yesterday, not last night. It was while I was, whilst I was working on. Um, no, it was last night whilst I was working on the song Havana, which was this piece in six eight. I didn't necessarily get the hi hats that I was looking for, 
And so I, I went searching in some packs from uh, Native Instruments that I had where specifically they, were, they had tops, drum tops. And all they are is just cymbal work. Right. So you have there's a marketplace where you're sitting back and just doing all the top work. So you know, people can get their kicks and snares from their from their doors and all that kind of stuff in the DAWs quite easily. But a lot of people find it very difficult to program, particularly in terms of programming. They find it incredibly difficult to program. It still is. Yeah, I have trouble uh, because sometimes, uh, especially the electronic, it doesn't trigger as well. Mm. Uh, but also, even with drums, the way I was trying to replicate some of the stuff I used to play. Uh, and the fingering on an iPad is different than the physicality. Then, yeah, yeah. And, but once I got that, even still, it wouldn't trigger properly. And so I'd have to find I'd go in there, and it was just a pain in the ass. I'm like, this is not worth my time to sit there for three hours. In terms of writing one, no, no. To, no. to even just try to re fix what I was, what I had in mind, or oh, what, okay. I, what I played uh, 20 years in terms ago. of quantizing all that kind of stuff. Uh, quantizing and oh, fixing the, the missed beats because of the, technolo uh, the technology, not because of me, necessarily. Me too, but also... Quantizing is like taking out, going to a party, and your date, you think she's really hot. <laughs> is, this, is this going on, on there? <laughs> but this is what quantizing is. You, you go out there, and you find at the end, oh man, I'm going out with quantizing. Oh wow. And you get, the end of the night, it's just been, it's not been a great day. And you left searching. You know, you, you just left, you know, you think, well, so much for that. You drop her off and you go home. Life has been sucked out of you, but not the way that you wanted it sucked out of you, basically. <laughs> totally. <laughs> you expected more return for what you were investing than what's coming back. Yeah. I've always felt that you, as soon as I, when I've got to begin to quantize, quantize, particularly with hi-hats and stuff like that, when I've got to go down that road, I already know that I'm on the wrong track. Yeah. I already yeah. know that, no, you, you gotta find a way that you don't have to do that, because if you've gotta quantize all this stuff, you're taking yourself away from where, you're, where you really wanna be. Quantize it, only it, works if it's gonna be a, a specific beat. Like if you're trying to do a lot of the, the freestyle, uh, any sort of jam or a free fill, a free yeah, fill, mm -hmm. it, it takes away from the, the emotion of it. The push and pull that comes with like a slightly off time Mathematically, a slightly off time uh, drum strike. Whereas, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. quantize just makes it all the same. But totally, yeah, yeah, that's, that's absolutely the point. And that's the beauty of having, you know, it gets back to a question you were asking earlier as well about working with other people. No matter what gets done in the studio, um, the best option for me to this day, uh, even if it's not happening at this particular point in time, the best option is always to find or be with a person who's of the same musical intellectual ability so that you can communicate an idea and then that can be executed and it's all in real time. And the only quantizing that might, ha might have to take place is a couple of kicks and snares to line up, particularly if you're using uh, multi, um, if, particularly if you're using drum stems. You might want to make sure that as you do the drum stems, that all the, all the kicks and the snares are right on, on, on the beat. Because <laughs> if they're not... Well, it's going to be a little bit, you'll have an issue that can... I think I felt, found that with, uh, within Two Bitsville as well. It was the first time I used a live drummer for recordings, and so it was with multi-tracks. And it was the idea of getting, okay, so I quantized that track, but she, there's still this problem, I couldn't work out where it's coming from. Yeah, you quantized the snare drum, but you didn't quantize the, uh, the overhead mic, or the room mic. So you've still got, the, you've got this oh. variation. So it took me a little while to work those sorts of things out, getting into production. I mean, um, that album took about eight, seven months, I think, to produce. Um, because there are eight songs on it, and each song obviously you know, took around about a month to get each song right. So is, it, is that typical? A, a month-long songwriting process? Yeah, kind of is. Kind of is. Uh, the album that's coming up, um, like on Friday or next week, is made up of a mixture of singles that were released during the last two years that were just being released because I felt that I needed to do something but that I didn't have what I considered to be the album of songs. In fact, I do have the album of songs that I want to, want to record, the original songs. But um, 
that project started in 2018 and then went into recess during 2019 whilst I was working on other things and then of course had to stop because of the, sh the studio being shipped over to Australia. So those songs are in the can, so to speak, and this is brand new, uh, I think it's 11 songs that I wrote in 20, from 2016 to 2018. And they were all at different stages of recording. I can't wait to finish that project, because it's like, these are truly original songs. But to offset that during that period of time, I was also writing these other songs that, that didn't seem to have an album or a volume. And they were just being put out as, as singles. But I always knew that I wanted to have them collected as an album. And finally, because there's something about having, but it's, it's nice to have singles going out. Okay. You see the artwork, you hear the song, yeah, great, what we do. It gives you a little one month jolly, because each song takes about one month to do, let's say. So every one month I'm getting this little, yay, another single's coming out, and, and this kind of thing. But there's something about having an album out that means that all those songs, in this case, there'll be 15. They're all on one piece. And someone could sit down at one point in time and go, I'm going to listen to this, 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 this thing. And if they did that, then they might get the vibe that I get. Well, they will get close to getting the vibe that I personally get when I'm actually making the song. Because you know what it's like yourself when you're producing something. And you get closer and closer and closer to that time where you're going to release it. There's a lot of energy going into that, uh, into that, that process. And also to the point that you, you have also within yourself as the artist, whoever that is, be it you, be it me, be it somebody else, you've gone through a, a process where you've, you've come to face yourself and accept that what you are doing by your standards is good and that you want to push it out there to the world. So that's how I, I think. You want to push it out there in some way. And I think a bit more of a kid right there, Randy. I, I, don't oh, want, I don't want to do this anymore. I need, I need to stop working on this. My own sanity, get rid of this. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can, wipe, you can sort of detract from some of the altruism that I just said. There, there are, let's be cold and you know, like, uh, uh, merciless about this. There are points in time where you think, I can't do this anymore, it's killing me. You know, um, James Dean from Rebel Without a Cause, you're tearing me apart! You know, like, you just, you just, again, that's that pantomime of whimpers and, and sounds that you've got to make during the process. Uh, on your website, there's other things like getting away from the music, because uh, you talked a lot about your albums. Uh, we've talked a lot about your albums. Yeah. Um, we've mentioned the T-shirts mm -hmm. that you, you have, but I also saw that you have some voiceover work now, mm -hmm. and and then also there were audio packs uh, that you're making. Is this something new that you're exploring, or I haven't seen anyone else do this? Well, you know, the audio packs are something that I, because of the connection with Ableton, and how I was always confronted with, with people coming up with new ideas and I was downloading their, obviously I was looking for a lot of free downloads and that kind of stuff where they, different musicians had put together. In fact, I opened up one uh, just last night from a guy from New Zealand and it was sent over to me through a mutual friend and um, uh, where they're just putting down all these different samples that they've made, you know, be it, uh, be it drum beats, so a drum, a drum pack, a uh, drum kit pack, or be it a guitar, uh, packs. Now I've laid down a few guitar packs whereby you can go in there, download the licks, and you could use them in any way you want. You could change the tempo, you could change the key, um, you could cut them up to use whatever you want. So I've just created it's a little bit of a, a little bit of narcissism on the one point. Hey, <laughs> listen to my style of playing, blah blah. blah. But uh, then there's also the non-instrument side of things as well, where I've made uh, some packs for um, film noir. Um, soundtrack stuff where right. I've just gone in and I've just gone in to watch old movies just downloaded off the internet off YouTube and I've just gone in and downloaded these slabs of soundtrack that I've been able to get from within a particular movie and then just cut them up and to rearrange and all that kind of stuff uh, I've also made uh, sound packs of Teddy Atlas no surprise to my favorite boxing analyst because I just love that guy's voice so there's all these different you, know, you can hit you can download the pack into a sampler you can hit a key on the piano and then you've got this particular thing, you've got that thing, which could also be just like a, a key drum, snare drum, hi-hat, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I sort of see that as being, um, there's a, this, you know, it's part of this idea that it, it, it could have pecuniary value for me down the track. 
may and it may not. I don't know. But this goes into the studio that you're building in Tasmania as well. I think, yeah, 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 yeah. The studio is the next step, right? The studio in Tasmania is, it's built and is, um, but the studio itself, the technical equipment, the uh, hardware and the software, uh, well, software's online, so I can get that software anywhere that I am. But the, but still there's a lot of stuff on, on, on the hard disks that are in the, on the docks at the moment and the, all the computers and stuff that are there and the monitors and the, uh, the mixing desk and the microphones and the stands, all that kind of stuff. The, uh, there's uh, 31 guitars in, in that consignment. There's another uh, one, two, three here now. And there's another two in Brisbane that I'm picking up along the way. Then there's another two in Melbourne as well. So what a, there's a That's lot almost guitars. 40 guitars. It's getting close to it. They're not collectors, state-of-the-art guitars, but they're, 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 they have a, each of them has a story. Um, but yeah, the studio setting up in Tasmania is about being in Tasmania with Touchwood, the and fingers crossed, the enough internet juice to have the studio working uh, globally. And one of those things that'll be doing is that it will definitely be doing music production for uh, solo artists and artists that are not dissimilar to what I do as you know, guitarist and uh, singer, but also to um, composers who might want other sources of music to help their compositions, which could also be solo artists as well. Um, it could be for making soundtracks as well, but utilizing different musicians from all over the world. So with the remote technology that we have available now through, um, uh, let's say through Cubase that I was talking about before, uh, VST Connect and VST, a VST Performer and VST Producer. These two software pieces allow me to, in, to link with people all over the world, including yourself here in China and or Canada or wherever you move to next if you wanted to, to, to do so. So that individual musicians can be recording from their own studios and, and performing and printing onto my, uh, onto my uh, computer. Being that this is definitely for uh, a business venture, so that I'm actually producing music for somebody because they want that music, be it a soundtrack, be it, uh, uh, for example, in terms of voiceover, there's a company might want to get a, a voiceover and get a read with a particular accent that they're looking for, or a particular um, style of narration, uh, then I'd be looking towards recording people, again, from all over the world. And I've got, luckily, by virtue of the job that you and I do, um, or that I used to do. Uh, there's a lot of good voices in there, and a couple of those voices are already on my... Oh, yeah, so you've already sampled some. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sa both sampled, but also have access to, to using their voices down the track. In the right. Future. So that you know, the, the, the email would go out, or the messenger would, message would go out, a messenger saying, listen, this is the project, blah, blah, blah. Um, can you do it? Have you got your headphones still? Or have you got a, a certain kind of a microphone or whatever? And the beauty of this is that in some cases, if it's on an iPad, it's better on a computer because it's the software, the, the, uh, the musician or the performer, as opposed to the producer, let's say that I would be the producer in the studio in Tasmania, the performer could be a person as yourself playing drums. Um, that from a drum point of view, there would definitely be a need to have four or five microphones from a guitarist point of view there would be a need to have a sound card to go into a computer right from a bass bass player's point of view the same as for a voiceover uh voiceover or trumpeter they would need to have or saxophonist they would need to have a recording mic and a decent set of headphones and that's all that they need to have no cost beyond that because the software is freely downloadable to um a, a, a pc or a mac so you're looking to more get into music production rather than music creation. Which way is it, uh, or are you going to try to do both? I'll be doing, I'll be doing both. It'll be a definitely a, a project that I'll be looking towards doing my own music and my own keep my own performance side happening. But I'm looking towards bringing, I'm looking towards monetizing monetizing the uh, the whole studio, much more than I was doing in the period of time when I was in China, because in China, you know, it wasn't necessarily possible. And also, contractually, we were bound to be able to do one particular job. So I was pushing it to the max as to what I was getting away with. 
but then I would have crossed over the line, so to speak. And also time as well, whereas now I'll have I think that was the biggest thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, we, we both know and uh, that we were traveling a lot, and there was a lot of downtime. Well, I started to use that downtime positively, I thought, by virtue of writing, because I was doing a lot of my writing on the road. So. Yeah. Yeah. See, and I, I, I couldn't do that uh, for me musically. I just I wasn't able to use the uh, use logic as well uh, as easy just to get something going. Yeah. Uh, so, but for me, instead, I, I just focused on learning Chinese instead, which I don't know. Maybe that'll become the next step of some sort. Well, that's part. It's part of. It's one of the strings. I mean, uh, I've come out of. Uh, it's over twenty years in China. By the time I leave here, I can function as I know you can as well, I can function very comfortably in this country now by speaking and listening. I can't read or write, but I can get by and have the most incredible and funny conversations with people. Yeah, see, my listening is still garbage. It's just, I, I, I kind of get what they're saying and I can communicate what I need, but I mean, I, I can't. But one success I did have this just recently was being able to actually read the newspaper. That's Brilliant. something, Brilliant. I, I sat down and started reading and I'm going, hey, I actually know what these characters mean. Like, oh, man, I not just recognize them, but I was like, hey, I actually understand what some of them mean. Not all of them. I can't sit there and translate just yet. But I went through a period of time where I could do that close. I could understand, in a paragraph, I could understand maybe the main idea on a good day, on a good day. But that was around about 2009, 2010 when I was targeting reading and writing. Right. Uh, but I, I just let that go. By 2011, 2012, it had stopped. So Listening, is I'm that my future then? No, not necessarily, because you've taken <laughs> me to a board where you've already gotten to a, a stronger level already. I can tell that from the way you described that. Um, the listening side of things is really kind of cool. I look at it upon, upon it as the truly ultimate period of or definition of autism. It's like <laughs> whatever you're saying, you know, ultimate doesn't mean shit to me because I want to talk about what I want to talk about. Right. So it's like you control the conversation. It doesn't matter what they say. They've understood your question. They begin to reply to you. You don't understand what's going on, so you turn it. You know what I mean? It's a skill that uh, I've taken it on board to allow people to come away feeling, man, that guy's good at his Chinese and he's trying to communicate with us. But, but I wonder how much of them do that to each other, like whether or not they understand a lot of it. And I don't mean that I don't mean that Chinese people don't understand each other, but I mean just in terms of, especially in Beijing, there's so many different people from all walks of life within the Chinese sphere hmm. that I wonder if they're at all listening to each other. Like, I, did you hear what I actually said to you? And I think we do it in English too. As Probably well. like someone says something like, okay, anyway. So what as I was saying. Probably, but I think here the the propensity for that to happen is greater because of a the speed. B, the population, yes. speed, speed relating to people who just don't have time. Uh, population, and then getting back to that idea of time, people are frazzled here. You know, I mean, if one thing, the COVID thing, oh, I did coin last night that the phrase COVID, it's just, such a, it's just such a rotten name. It's rotten, I like that word. It's a rotten name for a disease. Uh, I just didn't, I've never really liked it from, okay, so there was the coronavirus that sort of rang. But I'm defaulting within myself. It's just a game I'm playing. I'm defaulting. <laughs> I, I kind of like bat flu. You know, I just <laughs> <laughs> bat flu. <laughs> I don't know. I said that's not doing a lot for the bat. You know, for the bat image right now. No, but, poor poor bat now. Yeah, poor bat just sitting back in his cage, hanging upside down, waiting for his next dose of blood. And you know, like all of a sudden, I mean, you know, what happens to him? Yeah. Uh, we have been going on quite a long time, but uh, I also want to ask about. You, you, why China? Why did you come here 20 years ago? Because you've been here for a long time. What, what was the impetus? I, mean, I mean, remember we said a little earlier, just I know that that's a, a good question to ask you because people might, this is where the, the podcast might be. Uh, well, especially now to, with the corona, coronavirus, people are questioning where they are. They might have a chance to jump, and I don't mean off the building, hopefully not if you are, get some yeah, help, yeah. but like make that change. I mean, so what, what attracted you to China? What kept you here so long? And what, what was the setup? Uh, I had had in Sydney, which in the day, and we're talking here in the 90s, by the mid 90s, Sydney was becoming very much uh, a popular destination for many people from, uh, particularly from Shanghai and from Guangzhou, were moving to Sydney. So there was a rise in, uh, 
immigrant and Chinese migration to, to Sydney. And I'd moved to Sydney from Melbourne where I'd left and left the whole music background. In Sydney, it was very much a non-musical period of life for me. Um, and I became a Mr. Chits in the world of language education. I sort of studied a diploma and stuff like that and decided that I would teach English because all I was looking for was where is my next dollar coming from, looking towards justifying my existence as an individual, knowing that I had a full-time job that I could support myself. I was just, I was, you know, in my 30s, struggling to support myself uh, and thought that I needed to change my life a little bit. So uh, that took place in Sydney, but then it was more broken and false promises. No opportunities of real confirmed work were coming in. It was freelance. Uh, it was all on short-term contracts. And I was getting very tired of it by 1998. I thought, this is not really where I want to be. I wasn't fully enjoying the work that I was doing anyway. And I was traveling all over that city, it's a big city, uh, and working sort of 16, 17 hour days just to make a living. Mm. One thing led to another, uh, along the, uh, and along the way there was, inevitably there was a relationship with a girl from, from, from China. We all have that story, yeah, don't yeah. we? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that, that came out in my case, but it came out in, in, inside uh, Australia rather than actually being in this country that I'd gone to you know, and found uh, you know, a native girl in, in this foreign country kind of thing. I actually had this relationship with this Chinese girl in Australia and it was one that I was, um, you know, I was kind of happy enough with, but I was frustrated by it as well. It's a lot younger and I was um, meeting a lot of different women as well, so I wanted to play that style of life as well. I wasn't committed to just being with one girl, so the relationship was teetering because of that. It ultimately finished. I didn't know what I wanted to do, I just know I wanted to get out of it. But by the relationship with that girl, I just sort of discovered that maybe going to China was a way of uh, life in the future. I could, I could learn about myself and find out different things in the country and go to a place where I'd never been before. So is China the only other country that you lived in or have you been No, I lived in Vietnam for a little while. A while? And then um, I was a small amount of time in Europe, but not, not a long period of time. You could really... You could probably quantify this as being, this was the only other country that I, I moved to. I was never a great traveler as such, but I, I've been to a few different countries. Right. But I wasn't what I considered to be a great traveler. I certainly didn't do what, what you did by going to another first world country <laughs> and working in another first world, like the States or Canada or something like that. Where, don't get me wrong, I've always wanted to go, had always wanted to go to the States. And this year, was going to be a year that I was going to go back to the States and travel around and play music. And um, I think that opportunity has now been... Be tough now. It's really tough, yeah. It just as uh, I feel for um, I feel for our American brothers and sisters right now. They're going through a torrid time as a, as a country at, at multiple levels. So China... Um, jumped up, it opened, it, it, it opened up its arms to me. I had a good position initially with um, uh, an Australian polytechnic called TAFE, you'd be aware of Oh yeah, yeah. They sent me over here, it was a good job, terrible conditions, um, <laughs> money was good. Entry level, right? Entry level, yeah. And, and rather than leave China when, when I decided to quit that job after two years, and now 2001, rather than leave the country and just go on back to Australia and just do things back there or go to another country as well. For some reason or other, I decided to stay on. I think one of the reasons was I'd met another girl by this stage. That's sometimes usually what happens. <laughs> and that was a trigger to a, to a point for staying on. Uh, I think back of my life at varying points in time and one of the main triggers for being at a spot at a point in time has been the female side of the equation. You like I mean, there's a woman or a, p a person of interest in your life, then you, you tend to gravitate towards that. So I hung on in China and then I found a job and it's a job that I stayed in because I thought, well, once I started doing that job, I began to realize that, wait a minute, this job is so comfortable for me to do and I can develop other things in my life that I wanted to do. And part of those things were becoming, I wanted to return to music. I had seven, eight years out of music and I wanted to return to music. I split up with that particular girl that I just mentioned then, which was kind of cool because it allowed me to, to fully go into that thing. One year became three, became five, 
became 10, and the next thing, 2020 came along. So there's not too many of your, your type 20 years in one country. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of the guy from Aero Factory, the pub down the street. I mean, he's been here since then. Yeah. There's yeah, a yeah. couple of our colleagues been here 15. 15 years is usually the number you hear. Yeah. But it's not 20 years. And anyone from late 90s or even early 90s, you don't see them. But that's also probably because they're, they're growing up, they have kids, they're probably even getting onto grandparent level yeah, according yeah, to Chinese sure. standards. Yeah, yeah, but definitely, definitely. I mean, so like in terms of being an expat, I mean, how was that for so long being away from your, your country of birth? I never, I don't think I ever, I, I didn't ever really stop to think about it. It just seemed to be that this is what my life was. Mm -hmm. This is how it is. And I'll, this is how I wake up every day. And this, I wake up and look out and that's there, the sounds that I hear, <laughs> that's the food that I see. Uh, they're the cities that I see. As you know, I was traveling all the time anyway, at least once a week, um, and I was enjoying that. So for me, it was like, I knew what it would be like for me to go back to Australia at any one point in time. The only thing I really missed was something that I didn't do a lot of, even when I lived in Australia, but one thing that I'm looking towards doing when I go back to Tasmania. The one thing that I was missing was the beach. But I was never a beach person. Right. But you know, I, I could I could body surf with the best of them. I could never really surf as such. And and the one thing I'm looking forward to is the studio that I've, that I've built is nearby uh, some of Tasmania's surf beaches, and the, and they're about eight or nine kilometres from the house. So, so the plan is that I'm going to be going and doing some surfing down there. So the one thing that I missed in the elongated time in, in China, but what I didn't miss was the fact that I was growing older. And growing more and more invisible. I did not miss that at all. I was be in, in what way? In the fact that as I became more and more involved in Chinese society, and because I made a decision not to take a long-term relationship after a few years, I decided I wouldn't take a long-term relationship here in China. There was no involvement with any family. Right. I, ha I had no the dreaded parents-in-law scenario. I didn't have that. Which you hear from some of our friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 brutal. It's brutal. It's 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 damning. It's brutal. I and mean, there might be some positives, but I don't hear too much said about the positives. And I wonder like, what what is the positive. And I, I understand that some of the people that uh, who came here 10, 15 years ago, meeting women back then, or even meeting a woman five years ago, would be far different than meeting a woman today, mm -hmm. given the current social media climate. Yeah. Like I, I don't know the the next crop of expats how they're going to function, I, I, I don't understand. But this is this is me 10 years on in my travel life. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that you're now 10 years, are you 10 years here now? Not China, but I've been bouncing around for 10 yeah, years. Yeah, 10 years, yeah. I think that's an interesting point. You get to a certain level of year, number of years, and you were talking about, you know, how did I balance it with the idea that I wasn't back in my own country. I, I had long lost this so-called there was certainly no level, there was no form of nationalism. I didn't, I didn't harbor any nationalism. I didn't sort okay. of feel that I needed to be back in Australia because of this, that, the other. I didn't harbor any interest in the game. I don't even follow the main sports of that particular country. I used to play the main sports and I was quite good at the main sports. Uh, and it would, had I stayed living there the whole way through, I reckon I'd be like the average Joe. I'd be watching, waiting for my game to come on every week, but I let all of that go. and. Happily so, I found other things in life to, to entertain me. And I, I was like, as, it, as the years went by, whatever I needed or whatever I missed from that particular part of the world, I didn't need anymore. I, I, had, them all, I, I had them all here. I built another life here. And I would have stayed on here um, till, till the cows would come home. Right. I would have stayed on. but. It was not possible by the laws of the day. I mean, I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't qualify for a, a green card. I got very close, but didn't qualify for a green card. And as a consequence of that, I couldn't, couldn't have stayed on and just assumed a normal life here. I would always have been under the, um, the control of the government by virtue of a visa, and then visas would not be issued for somebody like me who'd gotten too old for work, as they say. Yeah. Blah blah blah. And, uh, and beyond which too, I mean, I'd gotten to a stage that I didn't want to work anymore except for working in my own studio and they would not give me a visa. I've already asked them that. 
Uh, we're very sorry. We're happy that you would like to have your studio here, but we can't offer you a visa. Which is bizarre because, uh, and this is something that a lot of people who've never lived away from their home country don't get, mm. where it's like when you come here, especially to a country like China, you are here for one job. That's it. Yeah. Like, yeah. And to, tr to change jobs, it's not like if I become unemployed today, I could walk down the street and get another job tomorrow, no problem. I can, but legally, you got to go through a visa change process and everything. It's not like in Canada. I mean, I get unemployed today. Technically, I could walk down the gas yeah. to the gas station and get a job. Absolutely. You kind of give up that right. You give up yeah. that right. That, that's a right that, that an individual has. And a Chinese person has that same right here in their, in, in their own country of, of, of birth. They can lose their job today and, and go and get another job of sorts. Or work another part-time job with the yeah. original job, with the which original we job. can't do which, according to law. According to law. Uh, but, you know, again, as I was saying, we were people have been, and I was as well, I was pushing it in terms of what I could get away with. Uh, but then again, too, pushing it in what I could get away with, but not charging when I could have been charging because I stuck to the, you know, I stuck to the idea, the principles of the contract was that, no, you can only have one job, so to speak. So there were times that I was producing other people's work where I could have charged a lot of money. Yeah, uh, but I and sometimes I, it's good just to do things Pro bono, be like, all right, just do it for the learning experience as yeah, well. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. And, and I know, like, at a certain point, you're kind of like, no, I don't want to do this pro bono anymore. I, I need to. to but it's a, ne it's a necessary part. And then, again, that's that 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 links into why did I stay here and in China for as long as I did? I've always been what I consider to be a slow worker in terms of the artistic side of my life. I'm a slow worker. I, I work on songs as I'm rehearsing songs. It takes a long time. I will I, I will not play a song live as a song that I'm performing live unless I've gone through so many different takes, so many different rehearsals. You know, I, I take a long time to do things. So the China experience for me has been a lot of pro bono and this was a great place to do it in because I could get away with it by virtue of having this other job that allowed me sufficient income to buy what was necessary, to, to effectively buy the things that my future would require, like little things like, uh, we're looking at one right now, to make sure I got enough micro mic stands, microphone, cables, cables, all that kind of stuff. All the cables that are bought here that are now on the docks, plus some more that are going to be sent back. But even the computer, like I mean, to be able to buy a nice computer that you can use for the foreseeable future. That's right. Five, six, ten years, you can make it work, right? I mean, and you're you set. Can, you can do that so much easier here, and that's where I mean, all the computers that I own now have all been bought here. They'll probably still be, uh, excuse me, there'll still be another one. It'll go back. Like I'll probably pick up another. Um, don't know whether it's going to be a, a Mac Mini or a Mac. Another, I've already got two of them, but it could be another one because they're going to be very useful in the studio. It could be another, the latest Mac Mini I might pick up here. I can get a good price on one here, better than I can um, online or at a Mac store in Australia as well. So I might pick another one up as well because they're or a MacBook Pro. I don't know yet which way I'll go. So with your time here, uh, and I know I've taken a lot of your time today, but I appreciate you spending the time with me, uh, but what have you seen change, and do you see anything that has majorly changed right now? Because we live in very, they say, interesting times, but you have the, this life experience that's probably give you, it gives you a perspective that a lot of us youngins don't, especially as social media, mm. um, sort of people who are always there twittering and stuff like that. Is this just something that's going to pass, or is this a fundamental change? I mean, what has changed in, in China and maybe in Australia? Australia, I can't really comment upon because I just haven't been there. Um, in the last last fifteen years, I think I've been in Australia um, four times. Wow! Uh, and the stays were very short. The last two times were totally for. To be in the studio um, to record the drums, get down there, and then get out of there. Because you know, by this stage, obviously, I had my own place and like kind of stuff—a rented place that I had here. In China, the changes are headed massive. <laughs> um, it's hard to go back. I mean, when I got here, it was big. It's much bigger than what we're used to in Canada and in Australia. It's just huge in terms of not only the space, but also the, num the pure number of people. So the crowds were always here, but it was nowhere near as crowded. It was nowhere near as crowded in, 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 in what way? In 2002 to 2007. And people talk about <laughs> Beijing's great change was 2011. 
the Olympic Games had. I remember looking looking forward to the Olympic Games to a degree. I wasn't. You know, I'm not. I'm not an Olympic. I'm not a big sports guy, right? Fan. Yeah. yeah, not, yeah. Not, that, not that way. Quite love boxing, but take me away from boxing, and it's sort of like, okay, well, you know, whatever. If that's what you enjoy. That's what you enjoy. But leading up to the Olympic Games, everybody knew there was a big event, and it was the first global event that China was going to celebrate. You know, major event. That, there were things happening in Guangzhou, but this was a major event that China post 1949 was going to be celebrating, 2008. So it was a major thing to look forward to. There was some adjustment to Beijing as a city, but not a lot. Then the Olympic Games went, and life went on like it was. I'd moved from just slightly out in the suburbs on the east side, down in uh, Tong Tonghui, which is like you know, uh, not far from downtown, but on the east side. And I moved into the, the so-called fashionable Sun Li Tun area and lived right on the strip. And it was, it was kind of fun. So for three or four years, 2.8 to 2.12, was a really good, fun time for me. But what I didn't see taking place, because you know, my work was in and around the Sun Li Tun area and then to an airport. Right. And I, did, I didn't see anything of the city. What I didn't see taking place was how the city just exploded outside the fifth ring road. Oh, really? And when I got hit, the fifth road, ring road wasn't even completed. It wasn't even a, a ring. It had started, but wasn't completed. The fourth had, and the third had already been here for many years. So what I didn't pick up on was how all around the city, outside the fifth ring road, the villages, which I used to love to go to, were now just being knocked down. I didn't see any of this for about, uh, until around about 2014 or 2015, when I finally had to go out because you and I or anyone else working with us at that time had to get a medical a long way from, from downtown, which happened to be outside the Fifth Ring Road. And so for the first time, uh, I actually saw what had been taking place since around about 2011, right. or 2008, realistically speaking. Man, that city had just gone off. Population was through the roof, and now I was beginning to understand why are the roads full all the time? By 2015, 2016, why are the roads full on Saturday and Sunday? At, at, at odd times too. You're going. What, what do you people do? Yeah, yeah. Why are you here? I mean. Well, this is what happens when you put, when you double the population from 16 million and you push it to 30 million plus. The official policy says it's 22 million, yeah. but. The official policy doesn't allow for the fact that anything outside the Fifth Ring Road is now part of the city. Oh, is that okay? <laughs> so, you know, it's pretty safe to assume that if you took the radius of the Fifth Ring Road and then said, okay, for the next 10 kilometers in that direction and that direction and that direction to the Sixth Ring Road, that's all just filled up with people. But it's not counted in the population. It's not counted in the population. So that you put 30 million, you double the population, and you're gonna get a lot of change because that just is an intensity of change. So that's been the biggest change, is that change on change on change has really changed the intensity of the city. You know, um, the people have changed too because they're no longer, it's not a dominant Beijing population. It's basically young people. So the population has gotten younger because people are coming from all over the country to make their living. You know, so we're seeing here, I would say what, what I've noticed is the old world of China the freedoms of China, they've all gone. It's now just, it's, because every, every area you went to was different. That was part of the freedom I'm referring to. Everything now is just a mass, an amorphous blend. Mm -hmm. I've seen the city lose its rustic colors of deep maroon and gray to become this sort of a bland plastic. You know what I mean? Beijing is not colorful. Shanghai would be colorful. Uh, Shanghai is very. I, I can't Hanbin comment on. Beijing would be colorful. Yeah, Shanghai in particular. I I went to Shanghai in 2016 and thought to myself, in the previous time I'd been there was 20, 2007, and then before that in 2001, and I thought to myself, man, this city has kept its character. Mm -hmm. I don't feel Beijing kept the character that it had when I first came here. When I first came here, it it, it oozed the national capital. Really? Yeah. So in what way did that, that, what was the biggest change in that, in that sense? Because that, when I tell people that I live in Beijing, I go, Beijing at least retains its sort of Chinese characteristics, uh, that I can go to a shop and not speak English, that I'm going to have to speak some Chinese. Whereas in Shanghai, 
you, you're, you can speak English to most people there. Or yeah, true, true. That's an interesting point. That's a change that, uh, you know, I, I would say I haven't picked up on because that hasn't really changed. You can still, as you're well, you know, your Chinese is much better than mine. I mean, you, you're fluent. I mean, yeah, but, of, and possibly I don't notice it. So maybe I haven't even tried. At least for ten years now, I haven't probably tried to walk into a shop and speak English because <laughs> I just don't possess, you know, the language. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm going to get caught out in the language the whole time. But I think my last major tantrums of not being able to speak Chinese okay. well enough to avoid conflict. They would have happened around about 2007, 2008, when I was working at a job at the airport uh, with a couple of other guys that I was working with in another job, as, as you might know. And we had a job, we were working as uh, airline, or air traffic control sim uh, emulators okay. for, for Air China. Uh, uh, yeah, for Air China. And so I was traveling out to that job a few times a week in a cab, and there were cab drivers trying to rip us off and all this kind of stuff and so there were some pretty good moments of frustrated use of Chinese language to, to English but since those times I haven't had to go down that road I mean if I've wanted to say something I've been able to say it in Chinese um, I see what you mean about Beijing retaining those sort of traditional things but I would say to offset that a lot of the hutongs They've been knocked down. They're all gone. It's they're not the real hutongs. They're not the real hutongs. They're kind of like touristic tourist hutongs that are left with a few token people to live there. The the other hutongs have all gone, and they were all here when I came here. Even in central Beijing, like uh, not not CBD, but around the Forbidden City, that whole area, the hutong mm. district, that they're all remade. Uh, they're they're not the old yeah, ones as yeah. far as they're I all know. they're all remakes. Yeah. Not as much as the Dashlar district, which is south of uh, Tiananmen Square there where they they literally ripped it out and then rebuilt it. Rebuilt it. But yeah. the other ones they've all been patched up. I mean it's it's kind it's of it's just not the same. I mean I don't want to over romanticize hutongs because <laughs> they're pretty tough places <laughs> to live. You know, the summer the oh. smell of urine, you know, you go to sleep with it, you wake up with it, it's there. It's not like where I used to live in, in Sydney, for example, above uh, an Italian bread coffee shop, you know, oh. you, you're not waking up to the sweet smell of dough and a fresh coffee. Man, that was alluring. That would drag you out of bed, down the stairs, into the shop, give you the coffee and the bread, send you a croissant, send you back up to bed, and you hadn't even woken up. <laughs> Here it's the hutongs, and we, we know what they're doing. Oh, they people. smell. Well, they can. I mean, they've, they've improved the toilets uh, a lot. They, they did that sort of uh, modification a few years back, that red bricking bit. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, in terms of policy, I kind of understand because there are so many people coming to Beijing. It just got out of hand. Sure. And, and is anybody, it's like someone came into your house, you know, is like, oh, can I put this chair here? Yeah, okay, no problem. Well, can mm -hmm. I put this chair here? Yeah, no problem. Can I have a buddy come in? He'll bring in just a coach. And then all of a sudden, say, you say yes. And, Next thing you know, they're building outside the window, uh, you know, a, an extra bed. You're going, my ah, guys, I gotta call this. I gotta, we gotta yeah. stop this. This is unsafe. Well, this is what was happening. This is another one of the changes, and it's been a, a frustrating change, because as time went by, through the 2000s, all these shops of convenience opened up everywhere. It's fantastic. Little cafes were everywhere. Street life was 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 alive. That's what I really liked about it. You, you didn't have to be in Sunday Tun to have street life. You could be in any one of the suburbs and street life was going on. All those, since I've moved into this particular area where I'm living now, where I've been since 2011 effectively, in this, in fact, I've been going to this one police station for re registration now, so for, for nine years. Um, all the shops, all the stores, all the restaurants, there was a, they've all gone. They've all been knocked down. Oh, but, okay. What it, what it exposed was, they'd all been built illegally. <laughs> they'd all been attached to people who'd given permission initially to do a little bit of a thing because they might not be there for a long time, but all of a sudden one would become 50, become 100, become 200, you know. So all those shops have gone in the last three years. The, the, the crackdown inside the last three, since 26, since 2015, so the last five years now, yeah. the crackdown has been immense. The change has been one that as an older Beijinger, I'm struggling to um, take on board as being, yeah, this is my city, I love being here, 
it's really doing for me what I want. No, I, I'd be the other way. I'd be like a lot, of, a lot of old Beijing people are not very happy now because their life and livelihood and way of life is being taken away from them. Yeah. You know, the, the old Beijing way of life of, I mean, even uh, with respects to the, because I know that this is going on air, the respect to the national leader of the country, the national leader of the country has even condemned certain Beijing ways of life, mannerisms. Mm -hmm. um, People dancing in in street on the streets or uh, squares. They yeah, they're still doing it though. They still do it. They're not supposed to play the music loudly either, but they they're still doing it. So there seems to be like that. That's, and I suspect that's going to be the Olympic push, like uh, com coming closer to twenty twenty two when they yeah. start to kind of go. No, enough of that for now, uh, because for and whatever we'll, reason. Yeah, we'll we'll push it. We'll push it. We'll push it down. And we'll push it away. But but certain people in Beijing are, are taking. Uh, taking a hard line to that they're taking offense to that because it's the way of life that's mm -hmm. always been and it's a way of life that when you first come to live in Beijing you sort of look at it and you go well, what the hell is going on here <laughs> but you live here long enough you get you know, you, yeah. it becomes part of the pulse it becomes part of the, the man mannerism of the city it's like 7 30 p.m. Where, where are the old people that's, where are the grandparents dead? that's right it's it's the the ebb and the flow of any particular place place when the tide don't work the right way yeah then there's something wrong with you know, there's the, the yin and yang of that. It's not quite the same. They're the little things, massive changes. You know, like we could go on and on about this. Some of the massive changes, just just the building of airports, the building oh. of the uh, public transport infrastructure. It's all changing. You know, and of course the ever present, the you know the rise and rise of the Chinese middle class. Right. It's, it's got ramifications that cut right the way through. It's making my rent more expensive. Shit, yeah. some, some reason my landlord thinks I'm made of money even though I haven't been working for seven months. I go, I don't know how this is happening. We still suffer that one little thing, you know, the, the reverse racism kind of thing. Although it's not intense racism, but it's like, yes, we are Western. And there's a, a perception. There's a perception that we so, have money. And that's that, right. And that, I mean, if we don't like it, we can leave. Which uh, they say, you know, if you don't like where you are, you can go back to where you came from. Which I mean, that's... Yeah, I'm not sure how I would have handled it had my landlord come on in during this period and said, uh, look, you know, let's go back now. You're supposed to pay every three months where I've been paying every month mm -hmm. because, you know, I don't know from one month to the next. In my case, am I going to still be here sort of thing? Uh, the other one is that had she decided to slap some uh, increases, you know, like increases would have been, whoa, that's just getting out of hand. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, I gave you those figures before about what i got to balance up as to... You know, when have I got, I've got to make this decision as to when is it like, nah, it's backward bending now. Yeah. So, you know, and of course, through all of that, you all know I've got to suck up this weather right now. So for anyone who's not from China, listen, China has two seasons and both of them are kind of, depending on which part of the world you come from, one of them could be shitty, one of them could be okay, but one of them is just hell. And we're in the... Could be hell. We're in that right. And it's not even bad hell just yet. It gets worse than this. Oh, we're a long way to go. It's still a long way. It's only what June right now. I don't know about you, but the other day it was it was clearly going to rain. It was about four, five, six yeah. days ago. And uh, all I was doing was just hanging out all day. It's going to rain. I would go downstairs and periodically ask if you have you heard the weather report. And they'd say, Yeah, yeah, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. And I'd come back upstairs. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Come on, come on. Rain come what? It was a spit. That was it. And there was nothing. I mean, and then when you see the, you look at the map, and it's like outside of Beijing City. You're going, well, that didn't work for us here in the city. We're gonna have to live with the humidity. I mean, it's, the humidity spikes to like eighty percent in July and August. And I mean, I, I now uh, only in the last couple weeks, I think my body's going through its uh, seasonal acclimatization to the heat and humidity at night, where it's like I can't sleep well. I don't sleep through the night because I'm just. Constantly, bothered. I've kind of, I've almost given up. It's, it's just, just like I'm just playing in the middle through the night. I'm just playing games or watching movies. Right yeah, now. I can't sleep. Myself. I don't know who sleeps in this weather. I mean, I guess rich people who have air conditioning that doesn't well, sound like a jet furnace. Yeah, exactly. Jet engine. <laughs> uh, but there is this new thing that's on the market. I saw it advertised through the net yesterday or on the net yesterday. This young kid, apparently, it's, you might have seen this. It's, I'm sure it's being blurbed out now on social media. This young kid has invented this tool. That you can have a little box that'll fit into your room. It's very cheap. It uses practically no electricity, and it cools the room down to like eighteen degrees. I doubt that. I just have skepticism about that. Look, I'm an old person ready to buy a scam. <laughs> <laughs> it's called hope. Okay, I'm going. There. 
Yeah, well, it's, it's certainly uh, it's something you do need to be able to sleep well, because if you can't sleep, then you're not going to function during the day. But you just, you just don't. I, I, the whole city doesn't function right now. No. I defy anybody to say that they're, they're functioning. There's only one positive that we've got out of this thus far from, from, from bat flu. I'll get back to the name. <laughs> and that is that the population is still down here, and the uh, combustion of working life is still down here. Our weather patterns, as you know yourself, we've been able to see blue sky and white puffy clouds. We've never been able to see that in, you know, in the 20 yeah, years of being here. Something's weird. So well, because the, the the factories are closed right now. Factories are all closed, right. and the combustion, you know, the, the economy is in the tank at the moment. Yeah. They're saying. Yeah, you picked a good time to leave. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, in terms of in terms of you know, I'll take these memories of beautiful Beijing. Yep. It's like watching The Simpsons every day of the week. You know, I, I, this, is, this reminds me of Beijing. <laughs> and I'll be down there in Tasmania. There'll be this sort of grey period, like just, you know, summer, but this is grey. And I'll, oh, I just want to be back in Beijing. You know, every every day, blue sky. But I'll have forgotten, of course, the intense humidity, the fact that nobody sleeps, <laughs> and, and the smog that uh, can choke the city from time to time. Which will come back, you know, when, as soon as everybody comes back, and which has already been back on a few days since uh, since summer has kind of started yeah. as well. You know. All right. All right. We good? We'll end it there. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. How long do we go? That's uh, a good couple hours, yik yakking. You're going to edit that, right? Some of it. Now. We, uh, do you want to? I've got a little bit of water left. Do you want a glass of water? Sure. Yep. Let me get that Let me together. Make sure that this file save error. Wouldn't that be a ball kick? Cool ass. So fantastic. That was a blast. By that the way. was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you got, if you got something you think is good for what you're doing. Oh, there you go. Now I was going to ask you about the. the um